in Kew Gardens or in other places in the city, uh, some of it's going to get through and we have to prevent it from killing people. So we need to keep some pressure on the lower level drug markets. We have to identify where they are and decide how we're going to approach those. I don't think any of us want to return to the days of um, you know, mass arrests of low level drug dealers, but there has to be some kind of targeted response uh, because something's going to get through. Uh, and I really think we need a big push on treatment. Uh, I think that's critical. I'm not an expert on it, uh, but I do think that there are many, uh, there are people who come to substance abuse from uh, many different paths, and the same solution isn't going to be uh, successful for each one. So there has to be a broad array of options, and we have to do some outreach, because they're not knocking on the doors to get in. I've looked at the voluntary admissions, and they're down. Uh, and, you know, the real problem is the nature of the addiction itself. It's a compulsion. It changes the brain, uh, and people, when they are in withdrawal, have severe physical symptoms, and they feel ang high anxiety, panicky. They feel like they're going to die. Uh, and so, very often, they just go and get some more drugs. So, we have to uh, understand the nature of the issue and tailor our treatment programs. I do wonder if some of our treatment programs and our protocols were developed in response to the crack epidemic. And maybe we need to shift uh, and think more creatively about uh, both reach out and the programs themselves. Um, I think there is some um, cynical view of long-term treatment now. And I'm not sure that's warranted, as I say, it, with this problem, it's very widespread. It cuts across all demographics, and one size does not fit all. So we have to leave that open as an option, too. Uh, and, and I think a, a very uh, broad prevention message along the lines of the tobacco, anti-tobacco campaigns. Those were very successful. We're here in New York with all kinds of creative uh, advertising talent. I think we need to work with uh, that kind of those kinds of collaborators to get a message out that targets not just the user uh, people who are currently using, but those who are who may use. That's a, a, a group you really want to target because you want to prevent more people from falling into that black hole. I just want to say real quick to that that. Um, th unfortunately, the nature of the opioid addiction is such that people are less uh, willing, or less likely to voluntarily uh, go into a full treatment program. That's what we've seen, and we, we talked to the experts. In the HOPE program, one of the things we're very proud of is that although we're talking about people who have misdemeanor arrests, uh, over 10 percent, I think about 30 people, have opted into uh, inpatient treatment. So we've taken a misdemeanor arrest and converted that, in, if you will, converted it into an inpatient treatment. So. Uh, we, we think that uh, what we need to do is to sort of use the law enforcement, uh, you know, people use the carrot and stick analogy. I don't know if it's appropriate, but when people find themselves in certain circumstances, like they've been arrested, um, is a moment in time where you can sort of take a very low situation and make it into high. So that kind of works. We need to expand that. Um, but I, I also, one other quick point has to be made. So you have five DAs and a special narcotics prosecutor who are all saying they're trying to find innovative, thoughtful ways to deal with this crisis from the public safety point of view. Sometimes from the public health point of view, there's an unwillingness to understand that there has to be that partnership and that anyone who finds themselves in our criminal justice system, if you will, must be addicted and therefore should only be treated as someone who suffers from addiction illness. We have to be honest, when someone is really dealing drugs for profit, and it's deadly heroin, and it's deadly, f deadly fentanyl, that is a serious crime and has to be treated as such. And I think that that's something that we have to collectively get that word out as well. People who suffer from addiction illness need and should get help, but people who are dealing under those circumstances have to be treated as, as such, and, and that's sometimes that message gets mixed up, I'm afraid. In Queens, are you gonna look to do a diversion program here? On opioid, are you doing any diversion programs? So like, I know we have yes, Brooklyn, I, I, Bronx. Hello? Am I here? Okay. 
Uh, I mentioned before our Queen's Treatment Intervention Program, uh, which we're uh, in the process of starting, uh, and uh, where th that, that program deals with those who have already gotten into the system. We also have our, our variation of second chance, where we look for defendants who got DATs on these uh, programs, and we reach out to them and get them in to, uh, to be evaluated and treated as quickly as we can. So how similar are they to the programs? Well, I'm, as I understand Project Hope, they have somebody actually go to the precinct. Uh, that is something we're considering, just okay. the logistics of it, we haven't tackled it yet. Okay. Uh, we're not against it, we just don't have the, the logistical ability to implement that at this oh, point. Please, uh, we look forward to working with the county. I mean, it, we would love to work with you to figure something out. Uh, Chair, I want to thank you, and uh, lastly, just want to say, um, I don't want to stay on this subject, but police accountability and ensuring that, um, you know, obviously there's been some troublesome news that has come out in recent days and I would hope that um, the DAs are really looking into some of these things and I'll leave it at that and that you know as we move forward we uh, continue to push for more transparency and accountability uh, in that area so with that being said thank you uh, all for the work that you do and uh, we'll be working very closely with you thank you thank you Council Member Cohen, and let's um, let's just try to do three three questions each. Yeah, I'm not even sure I have three. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairs Lansman and Richards, and thank you to our district attorneys Excuse for me. spending uh, quality time with us this afternoon. Uh, uh, in all candor, uh, my DA brought me in the other day. She did let me go uh, after after we met, uh, and but. Uh, as a civil practitioner, I'm not really particularly knowledgeable about the, the workings of the DA's office, uh, but I, I, and I, and I'm, I understand uh, and agree with uh, Chair Lanceman. Nobody is trying to pit the offices against each other or su even suggesting that any office is overfunded. I don't think that's uh, on the table at all, but I, I don't really understand the disparity in the funding between the offices. I don't know if in your opinion that the, the difference is rational. Is it related to something? Does it mean anything? I mean, I understand that each borough is different, each county is different, that the needs are different. Do, do we think, though, that the funding is, is related to those differences, or is it just sort of historical anomalies or, or bad reasons? I don't know if any of you have opinions on that, but I'm very interested. I am, too. That's why I'm testifying. I'm going to keep testifying to it until we figure it out. But I mean, I've only been here two years, a little over two years. so. I, I don't know, have all of the history, but there's always been a disparity. That's all I know. And uh, we, we just really want to work to address it because it's critical to the work that we do. And unless, it's, unless we figure out a solution, DA's offices are going to continue to suffer, and we're not going to be able to see the reforms that really that you all really want us to do because we're just not going to have the DAs to have the experience and the knowledge and know how to get it done if we can't keep them. You know, having served as an assistant in the Brooklyn DA's office for over 20 years before being elected, you know, we sometimes look at our current situation and we're guilty of forgetting the past. You know, in many of these offices, you know, Brooklyn, for example, we used to routinely process, you know, well over 100,000 cases, same in Manhattan and other counties. Um, my highest year that I remember was 117,000 arrests. And so we're doing the work in pushing out low-level offenses and working with the police department and others to make sure that these low-level cases don't exist. But in counties like Brooklyn, um, we still have significant issues of violence. Uh, while the numbers are going down each and every year, I can tell you that um, every day my assistant DAs and social workers and counselors are meeting with family members who've lost loved ones or have had someone seriously injured. And we are underfunded. Um, we're all losing uh, our assistance to other agencies, and it's not right, and it's not what the public deserves. We deserve to have the best ADAs protecting our families. And if I could just, uh, Councilman Gowen, haven't sat there and now sitting here, um, it's quite clear, I think, in my mind, that it is mostly historical anomaly. 
Um, the, the boroughs all grew differently. Their crime rates grew differently. Um, the processes here within the city council and the administrations changed over the years. Uh, certainly the fiscal crisis, uh, crisis of 2002, 2009 led to a lot of un uneven cuts and then uneven restorations. Um, different advocacies through the years, it's just le led to this sort of uneven um, sort of uh, uh, amalgamation that you see now. But again, the issue isn't so much that we're uneven, we're all uneven to the rest of the world and the fact that agency attorneys with the same experience are making more than all of our uh, uh, ADA's assistance, that's the problem that really has to be addressed more than, I, I mean, uh, the differences county to county have to be addressed as well, but there's a bigger problem that um, throughout the years the, the, the city government didn't put enough money, didn't understand that it's the DA's offices that are really the ones who are on the front lines of doing so many of the things in partnership with the PD that we have to, that society has to get done. Want and wants to get done now as we, and wants to, and wants to get done now as we seek to keep the justice system more fair. Uh, just in, in terms of salary, uh, when I worked at OCA, if I continued breathing and stayed on the job, every year I got a raise. Uh, that is not the way do you do you do you set your own? How does how do the salary structures work at the DA's offices? Is it different from office to office? Um, it, if you could give us just sort of a, a an overview. I, I just want to say before someone else that uh, we've lost a, a few assistants, by the way, to the state court system because they make more money and they see uh, natural increases. It was a great job. Pension yeah. benefits are better, and and uh, we don't. Uh, we, you know, we we don't have parity with them at all, and it's the it's the, also it's the the um, work life balance as well because the more demands we're putting on our assistants, it's easier to go to a job that may pay the same or, and especially more, and they don't have to work nights, weekends, holiday, have these 24 hour duties. It's a lot we're asking them to do, and as we look at the exit interviews, a lot of times, and we're losing. My office is losing mostly to other city agencies as well as the courts. Um, they love the job, they love the work, but they have to feed their families. They gotta pay their student loans. And it's, a, you know, it's more and more work and the work is being, is more complicated and sophisticated as, you know, things change. The social media, you know, all, all kinds of things make it more difficult. Look, I was in the courts too, remember? but. You got a raise every couple of years. I went 13 years without a raise as a judge. So please, I really feel for these assistants because I live that and I know how real it is. And that's why I fight for them each and every day because I know what it's like not to get paid what you deserve and doing the work each and every day. Thank you. Our next panel will be state legislators and they can talk about it. <laughs> um, any other questions? No, and I was always you. for them getting their raises too because theirs was tied to mine. Luckily yeah. they finally, the you cell, know. The Council cell. member Rose. Thank you. I, um, I was gonna sing in my best welcome back Cotta voice. Welcome back Council um, DA McMahon to the chamber. Um, and, and I wanna start by congratulating all of you um, for your post arrest diversionary, um, diversion programs. Um, I, I think they give us a lot of value for, for the dollar. Um, and I can truly empathize with you in terms of the parity issue because um, our staff here at the city council um, no way make the amount of salaries that other administrative um, offices make so I understand what you're talking about in terms of parity. And so um, along those lines, in fiscal year 18, um, we saw an increase in the personal services, personnel services budget of 1.3 million, which was offset by a decrease in the OTPS budget of 1.2 million. Was any of this um, increase in PS, uh, personal services, um, used to offset the parity issue? And, um, and how did the um, decrease in OTPS affect your offices, if any? I think as far as using the money for the PS, I mean, we could try to do the parity ourselves. It's just that 
it's not guaranteed the next year. I might be able to fix right. it for that year, but there's nothing saying that I'm going to get it next year. So that's the danger of it. You can't pay them because you might have to decrease their salary next year because the money is not there. That's why it's difficult for us to do it without understanding that that actual money is going to be baseline used for the salaries and each year going forward that it's going to be there. Okay. And was there any um, impact on a decrease in OTPS for any of you? I mean, I, that's probably different for each county. I know with for my first two years, because I asked for the vertical uh, prosecution and, and I received the money um, from the city, it was great. But we forgot that meant you needed, you know, um, desks and, and, and <laughs> supplies and all of those things. So we ended up using the money that we had to fulfill those things and, and asking permission to use some of the money to do that in order to make sure that each assistant had a desk, or, you know, and, and a, a chair. I mean, something as basic as that adds up to a lot of money. So, um, you know, it, do, it did affect us. In Brooklyn, the OTPS is, as I stated earlier in the testimony, um, the decrease in that number really impacts us because we still have the rent to pay. And um, last year, you know, it was in excess of $13 million to uh, pay for the rent and light and all the other mm -hmm. services. So when we lose money in that area, we really lose it because that rent is a fixed number and gets renegotiated every couple of years. Uh, so it's been a hardship for Brooklyn. And, uh, for us, we didn't have a, a cut in OTPS this past budget year. Um, and the only increase in PS we had were the two uh, Eve, um, the um, uh, early uh, victim intervention advocates that we got as a part of a special pilot program through Mock J uh, for those two victim advocates. So that's all we saw in terms of increase in PS. It, that PS was not an across the board increase for the parity initiative that we've been talking about. I think those for a few select things, maybe in different offices. Okay. Okay. Um, so at our last meeting um, of this committee, you know, an open discovery, uh, on open discovery, several of your offices testified that you would be able to be more timely vis-a-vis -vis discovery with more resources. So, um, is that being reflected in your budget request? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. I did make that request. Yes. And yes, in Brooklyn, as I indicated, we'd like to do a, a pilot program and move our office to do electronic discovery. And yes, in Manhattan as well, especially with regard to the body-worn camera issue that's going to be part of discovery. It's going to need more resources. Great. I mean, we reflected that as well with the body-worn cameras and additional paralegals. Okay. And um, for my Staten Island DA, um, currently uh, Richmond County um, does not participate in the open warrant closure initiative. Is this based on budgetary reasons? And if so, what amount would enable our, your office to be a part of this effort? Uh, what we do in Staten Island is the Fresh Start Initiative, where we uh, set a day apart on a Saturday uh, and, in, and notify all those who have uh, open summons warrants to come in uh, and, and see a judge and have them cleared, and that's the way we're addressing them now. Um, it's an issue that I, I believe uh, that uh, we are handling that way is appropriate, given the fact that other people who received uh, warrant, uh, summonses uh, dealt with them. Uh, so it's, for me, it's an issue of fairness, uh, not so much budget. I could use some money to run those, uh, more of those fresh start programs because they cost about uh, somewhere in 30 to 40,000 time uh, uh, per clip. So if we could do m budget for that, I'd be happy to do more. Um, and would you consider um, using any of those funds to, um, to obliterate the 10-year, uh, the warrants that are more than 10 years old? Uh, we continue to study those warrants and those numbers and, and feel at this time that that's not appropriate. Okay. Thank you. Those are my three questions. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Menchaca. Thank you, Chair. And thank you all for, for making your case. Uh, I'm going to try to stick to my three questions. And really what I want to do is both kind of 
point to the deficiencies in our ability to figure out what I think the chair laid out really clear, which is how do we figure out a way so that we can get baseline uh, an understanding across. So I, I really applaud the chair's kind of focus on that. I want to drill in a little bit on immigration and the real priority on immigra immigration uh, units within the district attorneys. And my first question is really, um, how many of you, and uh, all but one have an immigration unit today, how many of you who have immigration units waited until the city or the council funded it to create the unit itself? You can raise your hand or talk to it, but I just wanna, wanna get a sense about how the creation of that unit happened uh, and whether or not it was in direct response to a, a budget allocation. So in, in Manhattan, uh, we did not wait to create it. It was one of D.A. Vance's first priorities in 2010, and he created uh, an immigrant affairs unit within the office. And more recently, we uh, appointed a council for collateral consequences, which is someone who's going to deal with the collateral consequences of defendants. So the immigrant affairs unit deals mostly with victims and those sorts of issues and individual cases, but the Council on Collateral Consequences is uh, a new position that, that was created to address collateral consequences such as immigration for defendants and take that into consideration when we are um, making decisions on cases. Well, in the Bronx, I started an uh, immigrant affairs unit with the staff that I already had. But it, it deals mostly with the victim side of it. Um, that's what we've done recently. But on a case-by-case -case basis, I've always kept an open mind as we study more as to the impact of what is happening in our communities with immigration. Of course, things have now really changed. Uh, we're, we're changing our focus and looking more also to the side of uh, the defendants. The, uh, I've met with institutional defenders, the ATM, and you know, I've kept an open door policy that if they have a particular case that is um, troubling that I would look at and I have I have done some things with them on as far as that's concerned but I didn't wait until I had the money I did it first and then asked for supplemental thank you Cal well, I'm gonna come I'm gonna come back to you though okay. uh, we can skip you really quick I just want to get all the all the all the unit holders and then I'll, I'll come back to it thank you so we've started our immigration we started with an immigrant fraud unit initially um, I created an immigrant affairs unit um, and the reasons were very clear to me I you know publicly stated that I believe that we needed to have an immigration unit that helped assistant district attorneys and defense attorneys and the judges understand the collateral consequences especially to low-level offenses um, and try to make sure that our criminal justice system did not lead to unfair and unnecessary deportations that destabilize our communities uh, and so we hired um, staff for our immigrant affairs unit without funding and hired immigration attorneys which are on staff now um, to help us do the work in Brooklyn thank you uh, we created, <clears throat> excuse me, we created our Office of Immigrant Affairs with our own funds. Uh, we would certainly like to increase it, and the uh, city funding would greatly help on that, but we self-funded it. Thank you. And, and to Staten Island, I'm just setting this up. Uh, really? I, I'm really, uh, I'm concerned that we haven't yet gotten that kind of priority in Staten Island. Uh, advocates have, have reached out to your office to really sit down. I, I really want to, I want to give you the opportunity to give me your sense of priority for this, not just this population, but for your office. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think everything that I've seen in the press has kind of been, well, the city's not funding it, so we can't do it. And this is more than just funding. This is about priority and thinking about relationship with, an, uh, with a community that is already afraid to, to connect to enforcement. So, what is your commitment mm -hmm. to really building those bridges and, and really kind of launching uh, a unit that is kind of connected to a pretty high profile situation for your constituents in? Uh, thank you, and that's a, that's a great question. And I think you have to look at my history uh, in two years in office and what we promised to do, what we set out to do, and what we've accomplished and what we want to keep on doing. But you have to look at where we started from when I came into an off uh, and we had 30% uh, less the funding that we have now. Uh, we did not have a victim advocates unit. I've doubled the number of victim advocates, including uh, multilingual advocates who really are on the front lines dealing with the victims of crime. And so they're working very actively with 
all victims, including many who happen to be are immigrants, uh, new immigrants for sure. Uh, we did not have a domestic violence bureau, so I had domestic violence cases thrown into the hopper with other cases, and they weren't getting the, the vertical prosecution that they deserved. They were not getting a victim advocate assigned, um, and so we set out uh, to do that, and we did it as well. Um, we were keeping track of thousands of cases by hand. Everybody had an Excel spreadsheet and keep track, kept track of their own cases. We brought an innovative case management system and had it customized to uh, better uh, serve the needs of all Staten Islanders. I walked into a terrible, terrible opioid crisis where 31 per 100,000 Staten Islanders were dying uh, every year, and we've taken that head on, and that, that affects all uh, members of the community as well. We didn't have a trials bureau. I set up a trials bureau, and as I said before, uh, we've more than tripled uh, the productivity of that unit uh, going after uh, guns and gangs and street crime to make all Staten Islanders safe including uh, new immigrants because they are quite often the victims of those crimes. So across the board, we've actively tried to make this office a 21st century prosecutor's office, and that includes uh, better understanding the nuances of immigration law, and that's the request I have because I do not have on staff now someone who handles that. Uh, that person will work in uh, very close partnership with our community partnership unit that is already very actively engaged in the new immigrant community. Uh, as you know, I've met with uh, many of the members of the leaders of the different organizations of the new immigrant uh, community, including La Comeda, uh, and they are working with me on the advocacy uh, to, uh, to um, uh, bring about this unit so that we can not only deal with collateral consequences of cases, but also go out into the community uh, to uh, proactively prevent crime and connect people to services as well. So I think my commitment is strong, but you have to understand that sometimes when you, when you have a, a certain limit of funds, and as you've heard all day, uh, all afternoon, this is something that we all uh, uh, suffer from, uh, it's hard to do everything that we are committed to doing. That doesn't mean we aren't going to do it, but we need partners to help us do that, and that is a budgetary matter for me. So thank you, and, and I'll just close by saying that I think everything you laid out is what everyone has felt across all the DAs, I think, would agree with you that that's the burden that everyone carries right now. And in a moment where priorities have to, priorities kind of show the leadership from the, the top. And so I'm hoping that, because I'm, I, my understanding is that your office is not meeting with advocates, that they're not connecting. And so if that's wrong, that's uh, fine. I, have, uh, I might have bad uh, information. What you I, know, what that I, is not true. And but what I'm saying, a, though. a recent I, newspaper article about the advocates meeting I understand. with me, and they're uh, saying in, in um, partnership in unison, they're helping me advocate to put this unit into Here's my point. Uh, Here's my realization. point. Here's my point. In Brooklyn, uh, where I have a strong relationship with our, with our DA there, we gave them dollars last year to do some really good work around diversion, uh, the diversion program. And that was met with a lot of work on the ground with police departments. That, that takes a lot of pre-work. I'm hoping, as the chair of the Immigration Committee, that I can advocate for you with a plan to maybe get you some dollars for an immigration unit after doing the good work where I can hear from advocates that there's a strong relationship. That's how this budget, this isn't just about giving you dollars, this is about really seeing commitment from your office to do that work. So if I'm, if I'm incorrect, great. Help me, uh, have me understand what is actually happening. Sure, Let's well, in, work term, together in to terms of commitment, but that on early diversion program, that early diversion program that uh, was be, is being built out now uh, by uh, DA Gonzalez in Brooklyn, is a model that we started in Staten Island after ten year, uh, ten months of planning and programming with the members of the community and putting it together, and and the police department seeing how it would work. So, we are very committed. Uh, to partnering with the community and but understand when I came into office there was no community partnership unit now it's fully staffed and multilingual we're doing that work so that commitment is there and anyone who knows my work in the City Council and anyone knows my work as a district attorney if I say that I'm committed to doing it I'm committed to doing it and I think the, the I look forward to working with you and your committee to getting me too. a Staten Island uh, the uh, immigrant affairs unit that it needs and deserves Looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your testimony, and um, we have a lot to follow up with, and we look forward to doing that. Next, we will hear from the uh, Office of Civil Justice, Civil Justice Coordinator, I think Jordan Dressler.
hold up by the sheriff. I agree. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, please take private conversations outside of the chambers. We are still in session. If you can find your seats, please, we'd like to begin with the next portion. Once again, please find your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to get started with our next panel, so please find your seat or exit, one or the other. Yes. All right, let's get started. Um, raise your right hand, whoever's testifying. Do you swear or affirm the truth? That, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Yes. Good. All right, who's going first? I will, thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Lanceman. Uh, I'm going to give some moral testimony now. My full testimony is uh, uh, presented to the Council for the record. Uh, thank you for inviting me to appear before the Committee on the Justice System today to discuss the work of the New York City Human Resources Administration's Office of Civil Justice. My name is Jordan Dressler, and I am the Civil Justice Coordinator. In that capacity, I oversee the Office of Civil Justice, or OCJ. I'm joined by Department of Social Services Executive Deputy Commissioner for Finance, Aaron Villari, the Office of Civil Justice's Executive Director for Legal Services Initiatives, Jacqueline Moore, and Sonia Lynn, General Counsel for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Providing civil legal services for New Yorkers in need, particularly legal services for tenants, is a critical element in our homelessness prevention efforts. By investing in these important services, we are already seeing results. Between 2014 and 2017, over 180,000 New Yorkers received legal assistance through the city's legal services programs for tenants facing eviction, harassment, and displacement. And at the same time, residential evictions by marshals have declined by 27 percent. In partnership with the Council, we are implementing the nation's first universal access to Council program, representing an unprecedented investment in legal services to help New Yorkers stay in their homes. The, <coughs> excuse me, the Universal Access to Council initiative is just one of the many programs that OCJ oversees, and today I look forward to updating you on the implementation of this program, as well as providing updates on other key programs overseen by the office. My testimony today will also discuss key points laid out in our 2017 Annual Report and Strategic Plan that was released today. 
This report describes the growth in civil legal services funding and programs in New York City over the last several years, as well as strategies with regard to key areas of civil legal need. With regard to programs, in fiscal year 2017, for the first time, New York City's overall investment in civil legal services for low-income city residents exceeded $100 million. Fiscal year 2018 marked the first time that mayoral investment in programs providing free legal services exceeded $100 million. And in fiscal 2019, the administration will be committing $124 million towards civil legal justice programs at OCJ. By comparison, in fiscal year 2013, total governmental funding, that city, state, and federal funding for civil legal services in New York City was less than half that amount, at $60.4 million. The preliminary budget plan for fiscal 19 includes baseline funding at OCJ as follows. $93.0 million for legal services programs for tenants facing eviction, harassment, and displacement, which includes $56.6 million for eviction defense legal services for low-income tenants in housing court, including further implementation of universal access, and $36.4 million for anti-harassment and displacement legal services, as well as administrative and staff support. $30.5 million for legal assistance programs for immigrant New Yorkers, which includes $5.9 million for legal assistance programs, including the IOI initiative, and $2.1 million in immigration legal programs funded by Community Service Block Grants, or CSBG, as well as $8.7 million for legal and navigation services and outreach through the Action NYC program operated in partnership with Moya and CUNY. In addition to the administration's commitment to supporting civil legal services, I want to acknowledge the ongoing commitment of the City Council to expanding access to justice by funding legal services. In fiscal 18, HRA is overseeing $24.2 million in discretionary funding added by the City Council for legal services for the working poor, immigration legal defense services for detained individuals, unaccompanied minors, and families with children facing deportation, assistance for survivors of domestic violence and veterans, and general support for civil legal services providers. No other city allocates even a small fraction of what New York City is committing to provide access to civil justice. The city's financial and administrative commitment to these important services has perhaps never been more crucial to serving I, and assisting I'm, low I'm sorry, I, I apologize for interrupting. Did you just say that you, you issued your annual report today? We did. Did this you give afternoon. us an advance a copy or anything? We posted it online and we have it. You posted it online? Yes. Wow. Was it your intention here to come and show as much disrespect to the council as you could possibly muster? No, of course not. And yet you've succeeded in doing so. I can't think of anything that makes it more difficult for us to actually conduct a budget hearing when the report that you were supposed to produce months and months and months ago, in which we have been patiently waiting for and working with you and, and, and trying to um, uh, be as accommodating as possible, they just pop it up on the internet. I'll tell you what, we've got a hearing, the, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice is coming on March 20th. Do you think that you could maybe be available that day and we can get an opportunity to review the port and then we could have a, a, a full discussion of, uh, of what your office has been up to for the last, whatever it is, year and a half? We'll have to get back to you on scheduling. What's that? We'll have to get back to you. Okay. Thanks. Does anyone have any questions? Do you have any questions? You're up. You ask, you have any questions? Go ahead, ask some questions. I'm sorry, council members. Any more of my direct testimony here? I, I, I don't think so. We're going to invite you back on the 20th. You can come or not come. Do you have any questions? Well, I wouldn't want to pass up an opportunity to um, speak about one of my favorite topics, which is the Universal Access to Council program, which is now being rolled out. Uh, I presume the report will fill out the picture, but um, I would like to hear, if you can, uh, the top line numbers of um, just how extensive the rollout is, um, how far we've gone towards universal coverage, uh, what kind of impact you're seeing on the eviction rate, the number of total cases. Thank you, Council Member. And, and let me apologize to the committee and to the chair for any misunderstanding about our intentions here. We've been working very hard on an annual report, really the, the, our second annual report, but the first to be this extensive and cover this breadth. 
We have been working as hard as we can to have it submitted and available before we testified today. And it was our intention today to share the key findings and be available for any questions that presentation of those key findings might trigger for the council. We're of course available to continue dialoguing with the city council, this committee, and the chair as needed. With respect to universal access, we are underway and we've been making headway. Let me set the stage by saying that over the last four years, as we've increased tenant legal services as well as other prevention efforts, evictions have declined by 27%. That translates to roughly 70,000 New Yorkers who were able to remain in their homes over those last four years due to not, having, not being evicted. At the same time, we're making significant inroads in actual providing, actually providing access to legal services for tenants in need. We built and are building the Universal Access Initiative on work that we've done in the courts through our HPLP, Homelessness Prevention Law Project program. And in doing so, we focused initially on 10 zip codes, now have rolled out to 15 zip codes to focus that are particularly high need, selected because they are uh, uh, high feeders of the shelter system, high prevalence of rent regulated housing, uh, high eviction proceeding uh, volume, uh, and other factors. We've spent the last year working on the intake and referral process in housing court, particularly in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Bronx, and Queens. We've recently rolled out in Staten Island. In working it out with the courts and with the providers, we have identified ways to truly connect tenants in need with lawyers who are able to, available to help them by placing those services in or near the courtrooms themselves where those cases are heard. And we've seen terrific results as a result. In the first quarter of fiscal 16, representation in the 10 zip codes that we had targeted uh, hovered at roughly 16%. That's 16% of tenants appearing in court on their eviction cases with lawyers. As of this past summer, the first quarter of fiscal 18, those numbers grew to 48%, a tripling in the representation rate in those 10 targeted zip codes. In Brooklyn alone, the rate of representation in the, th in the two zip codes targeted uh, that we looked at uh, was at 48, per uh, sorry, 66%. Uh, massive increases in the four boroughs that we implemented these programs and it validates an approach that we intend to take going forward, which is working with the courts to identify uh, ways to connect folks with services in the courthouse, in the courtroom, as well as continuing to pursue strategies to get people connected earlier and in the community. But we know we're on the right track based on these representation numbers and we, continue, we intend to continue. All right, well, I, I'm going to pass it back to the chair, but I, I want to just remark on one extraordinary stat that you mentioned, which is that the portion of tenants now represented has gone from 16% to 47%, I think. 48% 48% in the select zip codes, which uh, the, the impact on that uh, is it's just got to be tremendous. Uh, I'll be anxious to hear uh, results on, on eviction rates in those target zip codes, which will be the ultimate proof, I think, of the power of this program. And uh, I'm going to pass it back to the chair. I appreciate the time and, and look forward to continuing the discussion uh, at a future date. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Council Member Menchaco. Thank you, Chair. And I'm going to take the opportunity to talk about some of the things that are really important uh, to me as Chair of the Immigration Committee. And I want to start with a kind of general question about the new dollars that were uh, allocated last budget uh, at the tune of 16 plus million dollars for legal defense for non detained uh, immigrants in the city. And I kind of want to get a sense on a report from you about how that's going. Uh, I know we've gotten to check in with some of the advocates about some of the uh, contracts and just kind of give us a flavor to the committee about how that's working. I know that some of the contracts haven't been signed. There's some uh, you know, requests for connection with, with, the, uh, with the service providers. Just kind of give us a sense about where that is and maybe some issues that have come up with the, within those conversations. We're working closely with uh, our IOI, uh, administration funded IOI providers uh, to expand services, particularly for removal defense legal services, uh, both this year and next year. Um, 
excuse me, as well as to address other emergent needs. Uh, for example, just this year, just this past fall, uh, we uh, all saw the rescission of DACA, and we were able to mobilize quickly with our legal services providers to stand up Know Your Rights sessions, uh, legal clinics for uh, uh, hurried applications uh, to make uh, sure there was compliance with deadlines. Um, the IOI program and the IOI contracts allow for that flexibility. And uh, it's something that we went into uh, development of the program back in fiscal 17 uh, with an eye towards flexibility and being nimble. To be very candid, we thought that the opportunities that we would be working with providers to take advantage of on behalf of immigrant New Yorkers would be more positive. We thought there'd be more opportunities for status, more opportunities for stability. And what we're seeing now is a very, very shifting, and very scary landscape. And so we're working very closely with our legal services providers to understand what capacity actually exists, how do we administer that capacity through programs, how do we do it both this year and in the future, and at the end of that process, we'll see where that puts us and make sure that we're meeting the needs that we have prioritized. Thank you for that kind of overall, uh, not only commitment, but just kind of view of, of where these funds are going. Uh, there was something new, though, this year as well um, that came from budget negotiations last June, and that was something what pe we're calling a carve-out, a, a kind of new policy, uh, kind of a new policy. Can you describe what that is to, uh, to the committee, please? I'm going to defer to my colleague. Sure. Good afternoon. If you can I'm identify member. yourself as well. Uh, this is Sonia Lin. I'm general counsel with the New York City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, and thank you for the question. Um, sort of following on uh, what my colleague um, stated in terms of how we've seen um, the landscape shift in terms of need um, on the immigration legal services front, um, I think um, to address your question, uh, I think it's important to just you know state again how um, how. Um, uh, dramatically, um, we've seen uh, needs increase in the areas of um, immigration legal services, especially with respect to um, how immigration enforcement has really dramatically increased over the last year or so. Um, and you know, just to paint that picture, we've seen um, arrests by ICE uh, more than double uh, in the New York City area of responsibility. Um, and um, in fact, with um, with these arrests, we've seen um, the arrests of immigrants without criminal convictions truly skyrocket over 400 um, percent. And um, you know, we're at a state now where there's about 19,000 um, unrepresented immigrants in proceedings um, here. And so that just, I think, um, goes to show uh, you know, what we are contending with as a city um, in terms of need for immigration legal services. So with that um, in mind um, and um, you know, uh, in line with the city's really historic response um, um, and investment in immigration legal services, um, you know, the policy of the city is um, to support um, immigration legal services and to um, connect immigrants with those very needed services uh, with the exception um, of um, uh, for those who have been convicted of a list of approximately 170 um, serious uh, criminal offenses, um, so serious um, that they are on this list of offenses, violent and serious felony offenses that uh, the city council and the administration, um, um, you know, designated uh, in the city's detainer laws. So, and let's talk about that because that designation was was for what, just the detainers, is that right? I, I mean, I worked on the piece of ledger, so I just wanna ask the question. That's right. So that was for detainers. What, was, that also, was that also something that was supposed to kind of go beyond detainers? How do, how do we jump from kind of classifying 170 crimes um, uh, for detainers to representation? Tell us a little bit about that jump. Sure, I think I, we'll go back just to the context and the landscape here um, in terms of um, you know, the need for immigration legal services, the tremendous need, the intense fear um, and concern uh, that exists in communities around the city. Um, and um, you know, the, 
the fact of the matter is that um, although the city has made a tremendous investment in immigration legal services, um, you know, it is, um, you know, we, we don't have the resources to um, you represent every everybody, and so we're making strategic choices uh, and investments with the resources that we do have, um, and um, prioritizing um, and making sort of reasoned um, uh, uh, determinations about the distribution of ta city taxpayer um, funds. Um, you know, this is uh, you know the the gap is a gap at the federal level. Um, you know, and um, you know, the city alone is not going to address um, the failure of the federal government uh, to secure uh, representation for everybody facing um, uh, removal. And I just want to note that um, uh, the other program that has now been implicated into this uh, kind of resource issue is NIFUP, the New York, uh, uh, the New York Family uh, Unity Project immigrant family unity project, and that didn't have a carve out before. So this is new, I just kind of want everyone to know that this is, this is essentially new to that, and that has also been placed on that in deportation proceedings and deportation defense, is that correct? You know, I think, um, and um, you know, perhaps Jordan can jump in um, with the what, with what I'm missing. My understanding is that the NIFA model um, remains. I think one thing to note is that the city is not um, the only um, actor here. Um, you know, there are a number of funders um, in uh, the landscape. Of course, the city has made the the largest investment, um, and um, as far as the NIFA program goes, um, you know that. Um, the NIFA program continues to screen, you know, all immigrants, um, and that uh, the policy applies to representation um, with uh, with city city dollars, um, and that um, you know, in, in the last year uh, there was um, a sort of a negotiation with with the city council and the administration um, that um, permitted the the program to to continue. Okay, and, and I just want to note that. Um, that the only argument I'm hearing right now, and we're gonna keep talking about this a lot, uh, is resource resources. And we're in a budget meeting, uh, budget discussion, which is great, because if there is an actual dollar that we can meet, wouldn't it be great to hit another value that I think we all appreciate, which is due process, that everyone can do it. Everyone, everyone can get access to legal representation if we understand the changes in need. Um, so I'm really happy that that's, that's, that's a value. Um, but I want to also just say that due process is, is, is also value. And maybe my last question would be, how, it, how are the providers uh, responding to this kind of step that it sounds like we, we now have to kind of figure this out in a lot of different ways, that there are some people who have no criminal convictions, and there are some that do, that fall under 170 crimes listed for a detainer law, and now they have to kind of do something different. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you're hearing from the providers and how you're addressing those needs and those issues? Um, certainly. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, I, th I don't want to speak for our provider partners, but I think that there's a lot of anxiety about the how uh, this will be implemented um, without a lot of proof on the ground that this will actually change practice in any way. Every indication is that the uh, number uh, and the scale of um, uh, folks who might fall within this uh, category is very small. Um, and it's not yet clear how, if at all, this will affect um, the practices that these providers administer and administer well. Um, what I will say is that we continue to dialogue about the uh, implementation, about the logistics, and um, that's a process that's just gonna continue. Great. So it sounds like we're open to discussion. We'd like to learn a little bit more about what's happening in, in the dust beyond carve-out decision last summer. And I'm really happy that we can continue this conversation because I think this is going to be, this is where we talk about the budgets. It sounds like this is really a budget issue that we can really begin to dig in deeper about how we're going to make this happen. This, is, this budget is designed by uh, dialogue with the city council. And so I'm really happy that we're going we're gonna to keep talking about this. Thank you. I, I do want to be clear that this is the city's policy, um, and so you know the, the policy is that um, you know the city um, has 
and, and again, I, I, you know, I, I want to emphasize this because I do want to put it in context, right? This is tremendous investment in immigration legal services by the city, um, uh, with the exception um, when it comes to individuals who've been convicted of one of this limited list of serious offenses um, where um, you know, the administration and the council did um, designate for a cooperation in the detainer context, which is a different context, but related. Um, and so you know, I think um, uh, it is, um, it's, it's relevant to resources, but it's also, it's, it's also the policy of the city. Okay, so this is, new, this is kind of a new uh, uh, perspective or um, that I, want, I just want to make sure. So you're saying that the, the carve out is the city's policy. And so um, t tell us a little bit about what, how, how that's, um, uh, I, I, not legitimized, but is this, how did this policy, how does it live within the context of a budget, of legislation, of et cetera? Like how, how, is, that, how, how is that codified? Let me try to respond to your, your question. Yeah, please. Um, try to understand. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's codified with respect to how city taxpayer dollars um, for these um, contracts are, are utilized. Um, and um, again, I think, you know, to the extent you're asking about why, why this policy, right, it is, um, you know, it is. Or more like how. We get the why. I think we get the why. Okay. It's like how. Um, because I'll just stop you there, and this is, I get, let me just get to my point. Sure. Is that this is not the city's policy. This is the mayor's policy. This is the, uh, uh, the kind of uh, act of, of the mayor. And the policy, the city's policy, is determined by the city council. So we determine the policy. Um, and that's, so I just wanted to make sure that we, we clarify that because, um, you know, five minutes ago we were talking about an open discussion about this. There's a resource question, but then you kind of, you know, hammered the point home, which is that this is a city's policy. And I want to re clarify that this is the mayor's policy and that the city council has the jurisdiction to create the city's policy. And so we're going we're gonna to be moving now on two different paths. One, a resource question to really understand the resources that are needed to get us to due process, and then talk a little bit about the policy making as we get closer to the budget. And so this is not the city's policy, this is the mayor's policy. And um, I, you can confirm that if you want, but that's how, that's how I understand it. That's how we're going to understand it as we move forward in this discussion so that we can get to the goals that are really connected to IOI and knife up and, and just legal defense in general for, for our uh, for our immigrant families. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. So I want to understand the, the 170 crimes carve out, right, which was rooted, if I'm not mistaken, in the, the debate over NIFA. Is that 170 crime carve out being built into any other contracts, any other legal services contract, any other non-legal services contract? No. Okay. Good. Chair, if I can, um, I'd like to, uh, if you'll indulge me, walk you through the report and plan and finish my testimony. No, I don't want to. I, you can't sandbag me with the report. How many pages is the report? The report is long, but it won't take long to walk through it. Yeah, but I don't want to just be walked through it. I need to be able to understand it and formulate questions. I mean, it's really inappropriate for you to sandbag us in this way, to show up at the budget hearing and drop this report on us. I mean, we don't even have the report. We'd have to go online to look at the report. It's really not appropriate. So I have your testimony, and uh, so we will invite you back on the 20th. And so I can't complete my oral testimony? To no, there's a time people. limit. There's a time limit on the hearing. And at the start of your testimony, if I recall, you said you weren't going to read your testimony. You, it was written, and you were going to give us the highlights. I, yes, I haven't given you the highlights, but understood. Good. Thank you. The witnesses are discharged. 
So let's have the, um, the criminal public uh, defenders as our next panel. Let's hope this will be more pleasant. Raise your right hand. I swear or affirm that the truth, you're, that's, uh, I did it again. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, Terrific. It's the end of a long day, and we've gone over yeah. what you need to hit. So. We're gonna do five minutes on the clock, and if any of you feel that you really need more time, we will, of course, indulge you. So who's going first? I am going first. Ms. Longo. Thank you, uh, Chair Lansman. Uh, I'm Tina Longo. I'm the Chief Defender of the Legal Aid Society. It's criminal defense practice and a public defender in uh, New York City since 2002. Um, in a few short days, we will be celebrating Gideon v. Wainwright, the, the Supreme Court case that held that poor people, vulnerable people, oppressed people, have a right to effective representation and that the government has to pay for it when people can't afford it themselves. And I sit here right now saying to you that across this country there has been an unfunded mandate for public defense. And so we've heard about lawsuits in New Orleans and Michigan. We've heard our colleagues who are chief defenders in places like Chicago talk about high caseloads, no resources, and dwindling funds. And even upstate, five counties had to bring a lawsuit against the state forcing this state to look at the in inadequate funding provided to upstate counties. And here in New York City, for many years, we thought, well, we're in a different position. Our county, our city, understands the importance of public defense and has provided resources far above what our colleagues across this country and just a few miles outside of this city struggle with things like resources for social workers and investigators, paralegals, immigration attorneys. But I stand here today to say we are adding ourselves if we uh, accept the position of the city of New York in terms of their funding dollars for public defense, we are adding New York City to that list of unfunded mandates. And it's a sad day. My role is to present to you a history of the last RFP cycle so that everybody understands that stall and delay and no escalations in our contracts are jeopardizing our clients and our ability to represent our clients and is creating an unfunded mandate under Gideon. So in August 2nd, 2016, 
The Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice issued a concept paper seeking comment on the plans for them to issue an RFP that would take place July 1st, 2017. We had been operating under an RFP issued in July 1st of 2011. So this was coming up to the sixth year of the cycle. We held several meetings with MockJ as public defenders to tell them the importance of getting this concept paper right because the landscape of representation was changing. We were pleased to see actually in the concept paper that is attached to my written testimony that there was an embracing of the belief that the delivery of quality trial level services requires more than just criminal defense attorneys and that wraparound services such as social workers, immigration specialists, civil action attorneys were an indispensable part of holistic defense. Additionally, the concept paper included the opportunity for the first time in a very long time for defender organizations to bid for homicide representation for clients charged in those matters. While the breadth of services in the concept paper were broad, the anticipated dollar funding was actually not. And we raised that with Mock J. In our response, a unified response that we gave to them in September of 2016, we told them, we foreshadowed, that in fact, uh, $300 million across two years would keep us flat, and that in fact, if you increased the services and wanted us to do homicides in the way in which clients deserve to be represented, the dollar figure would actually be $300 million per year. In December 13, 2016, Mock J issued the RFP for trial level non-homicide and homicide representation, and the due date was February 16, 2017, giving us about six months or seven months to prepare, less than that, to prepare to implement the contract on July 1, 2017. In June 2017, after months of begging to get to a dollar figure to start our contracts, we were told by Mock J that they would have to extend our contract and not start the RFP July 1st, but to start it July 1st, 2018, one full year later. And that, in fact, they would be keeping our contracts flat, except for a 2% COLA that the mayor's office had promised. We obviously spoke up loudly. Again, the defender organizations joined together and in July 2017 sent a joint letter that is attached to my written testimony to Mock J detailing our need for increased funding. No funding was given and provided by Mock J as a result. In August 2017, we were all invited individually under the procurement process to actually issue a best and final offer. It was at this meeting that Mock J actually again indicated that they understood that what we needed were more services. So they provided ratios to increase the number of immigration attorneys, to, in, to add to our civil action attorneys that would deal with things like employment, housing, benefits, education. We were delighted by this. They increased the ratio uh, for social workers, paralegals, and investigators. Again, we were delighted by this, and we all began to plan, especially because Mock J told us at that meeting that we would have to be prepared to implement all services on July 1st, 2018, and that they would provide us startup funds in April of 2018, three months prior, to start to prepare, to bring on staff and train that staff to hit the ground running, particularly because we were going to take on homicides. So we all did that. They asked for budgets. And for Legal Aid Society, as the citywide provider, I want to paint a picture. I had to submit 66 separate budgets. And boy, was I happy to do that, because based on Mock J's assessment of the situation and the funds that they wanted to provide to us, I was more than happy to provide them the plan for how best we can serve as clients. And all my colleagues did the same. We were told we'd hear a number around November of 2017. We submitted those budgets uh, almost immediately after, so there were many months to prepare. Well, November 2017, I'm losing count of the years, 2017 came and went. No notice, no information. 
we reached out to Mokje. We were told we would hear in December. December 2018 came, 17 came, nothing. We finally reached out again in desperation and were told that we would hear something in February of 2018. That also came and went. So finally, on March 2018, Mokje contacted all the providers to let us know that yet again, they would be seeking to extend our contracts baselined, no additional funding except for COLA, for another six months. <laughs> that the RFP for non-homicides would not start now until January 1st, 2019. And just a few days ago, we were told that it is likely that perhaps they'd be extending our contracts now for a full year. And that perhaps, but unsure, that our homicide contracts would start perhaps January 1st, 2019. So that is the picture of the lack of momentum in providing the public defenders of this city the resources that we need to meet the growing needs that you all just heard were very present for uh, our adversaries on the other side, to which I point out that their budgets have gone up every year, in small part and in large part, for the last eight years. And on that, I will turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you. Hedeman, and I'm Executive Director of New York County Defender Services, we're a public defender office, who is tasked with representing approximately 25% of the people arraigned in New York County criminal courts every year since 1997. Criminal justice reform and the need to reverse the policies and procedures that led to generations of mass incarceration is thankfully, at long last, at the forefront of the minds and agendas of politicians and policymakers in New York City and New York State. Yet while public defenders are being asked to create a new approach to our traditional method of advocacy in the form of emphasizing the work of social workers, investigators, data analysts, and civil attorneys to better address the immigration and other wraparound services, the mayor's office has kept our budget for primary representation essentially flat since 2011. I want to give you some specific numbers. In the case of NYCDS, in 2011, our budget for primary cases was 7,236,000. It remained at that exact level through fiscal year 2015. In fiscal year 2016, it was increased to $7.4 million, a paltry increase of $215,000 over an eight-year period. The increase represented a one-time COLA increase of 2% and a line-item budget of $106,000 to hire a data analyst to comply with the ever-increasing data demands placed on us by MACJ. This is simply unsustainable. Today, more is expected of us than ever before as we work with all the criminal justice stakeholders to help achieve the goals and quality of quality indigent defense and the city and state's stated goal of closing Rikers Island. I serve on the mayor's uh, working group on closing Rikers Island. We recently celebrated getting the city's jail population down to 9,000 uh, individuals. However, the reality is that this decrease is simply resulted from getting rid of the low-hanging fruit in our criminal justice system. Through various city council initiatives that decriminalize numerous offenses, implementation and expansion of the mayor's supervised release program, and a change in prosecutory decisions made by some, but not all, but some, of the city's district attorneys, we all celebrated the lowest jail population in 36 years. But now the work really begins. If our jail population is to decrease from 9,000 to 5,000, our committed and skillful public defenders will have to represent clients for far longer and far more extensively than we have traditionally done so. If we are to eliminate the revolving door of criminal justice that has permeated New York City since the 1970s. For public defenders, this ne necessitates a significant increase in our budgets that better reflects the economic reality of operating our offices in 2018 and beyond. 
So let's talk about some examples. In 2011, my office was paying $412 per month to supply health care for an individual person. Today, that number is $711. If you were a couple, it was $986 in 2011. Today, it's $1,422. And if we're talking about a family, what was $1,341 in 2011, today it's 2027 Similarly, our rent has nearly doubled from a 2011 price of approximately $55,000 a month to our current price of approximately $115,000 a month. Yet, our budgets remain flat. Everything costs more, from pens to computers to archiving files, and of course, the salaries that we need to provide our staff, if, to provide our staff if we are to remain competitive and continue attracting talented and dedicated people willing to forego the high-salaried private sector. Where are we today? And I'll speak about NYCDS in particular. We are projected to have a $1.2 million shortfall just for the extension of the fiscal year. This doesn't include the RFP and all the wraparound services they want, but just to do what I've been doing. With this shortfall, Fall, I will not be able to replace lawyers that have either retired or left for new opportunities. Unless something is done, I will not be replacing my departures, and it puts NYCDS in of not being able to meet the standards set out by our state legislatures. In terms of the RFP, well, I will all skip down. In sum, it is unconscionable that we will enter fiscal year 19 with essentially the same budget for primary case representation that we had in fiscal year 12. We urge the city council to rectify this indefensible and dangerous underfunding of indigent defense. Thank you. Who's next? I'll go next. Uh, I'm Matt Connect. I'm the managing attorney of the criminal defense practice at the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem. Uh, thank you, Chair Lansman and the committee for holding this hearing and uh, allowing us to testify today. Uh, I'm here to urge this city council, this committee and the council, to remember what I know that, that you all know uh, already very well, that fully functional public defenders, a fully functional public defender system is critical to ensure that clients receive the effective representation to which they are constitutionally guaranteed. Not only are these defense services critical for clients, their families, and the communities from which they come from, but they're also critical as we all work together to reform the criminal justice system. In 2018, and as we continue to move further into the future, the effective representation of clients has become and will continue to become increasingly complicated and resource intensive. While it's true that the numbers of arrests and arraignments have dropped in the city in recent years, the reduction in the intake of, of cases has largely been comprised of low level non-complicated misdemeanor cases, um, types of cases that were generally resolved uh, at the first appearance at the criminal court arraignment. Those cases did not impact the workload of our staff in any significant way. Um, and the workload, so the workload of our attorneys uh, today um, is virtually identical to what that workload was before the number of arrests went down. At the same time, never before have our clients um, who continue to be arrested and arraigned, um, been prosecuted by such well-funded and well-resourced police departments and uh, district attorney's offices. Uh, and never before have our clients faced such harsh collateral consequences in family, housing, immigration, and other civil venues. Our defense organizations must be sufficiently funded to ensure that our clients are effectively represented in this legal landscape. And that includes funding that allows for sufficient numbers of staff attorneys, social workers, investigators, and paralegals. Um, as some of my colleagues have mentioned, uh, this is a very exciting time um, in the world of criminal justice reform. Um, those of us who care about criminal justice reform are pretty excited about some of the things that are going on. Uh, in recent years, we have seen uh, widespread and bipartisan support for reforms from bail to discovery to mass incarceration to caseload caps. Um, these efforts have been uh, widespread. Here in the city, with the support of Mock J and of the city council, we have seen the introduction of a pretrial supervision program, uh, an expanded commitment to diversion, and a realistic plan and commitment to close Rikers Island. Uh, we applaud those efforts and note that the success of these programs thus far has required, among other things, the really hard work of the defense organizations that are here today. From helping to develop citywide policies uh, all the way down to the 
front lines in the courts uh, where our staff attorneys are advocating for their individual clients, the success of all of these initiatives require that the organizations representing these clients have the resources necessary to do that work. I'm asking the City Council to consider the critical role that the defense organizations have played in ensuring the success of these initiatives when considering budgeting for these programs in fiscal year 19 and beyond. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to testify today about these important issues. Thank you. Um, I would like to layer on what uh, we've been talking about on the criminal cases to mention that um, at least three of us up here also provide services in family court for people in child, for parents in child welfare proceedings. And the similar type of drama, it's a little different, but a similar drama is working its way through mock J on family cases because the number of child removals has gone up, it's, I would say, triple what it was a couple of years ago due to increased activity by ACS. And um, despite our best efforts to get um, the city to be able to pay us, so for example, I'm the primary, the primary provider of those services in Brooklyn. Although working extensively to, to get adequate funding to take care of all those cases that we would like to do, that we have the proper resources, including social workers and other specialized services, education lawyers and things that are really needed in those cases, um, year in and year out, we have not been funded to do those overages, or if we are, it's not adequate. And so in my office, for example, going into 2019, the shortfall in my office is close to $6 million. When you add together the shortfall in a criminal, as you heard everything about, and the family shortfall. So I also want to mention, I know it's not really as much money, but the knife up contract, which I really appreciate you guys you know, talking about, you guys, council members talking about, um, also will have a shortfall next year because the little bit of funding we were able to get to take care of the 170 cases that were excluded is not going to go into next year. So there'll be another shortfall in that budget as well, which we'll talk about more at the immigration hearing. And that was funding that came from the private sources right. that the speaker was able that to they talked make about, happen. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So um, now, um, with that in mind, I wanted to t just talk about some of the testimony that you heard from the district attorneys today. We just did a quick back of the envelope math and adding up the number of DAs in Brooklyn, let's say there's over 500, I think I heard. Well, I have 100 criminal defense attorneys in Brooklyn, and Legal Aid has about 180, so that's 280. So if you think that we were originally had parity with them, even though they're trying to get parity with each other, that's already where we're starting from. We already have, you know, a little more than half of the, you know, of the line attorneys that they have. Um, Let's say there's 100 private attorneys or 18B or other kind of attorneys, so maybe there's 380 active defense lawyers in a borough that has over 500 prosecutors. And I just think that's an example of where we're starting from. We never had the parity that we should have had in the first place. We have done a lot with very little, and I think we've made New York City very proud with what we have done. We have established a continuum of care for our clients that has made it possible to talk about all of the changes that everybody wants to have. And I just want to emphasize what will happen when I have to attrit, let's just say I have to attrit 20 people in my staff. Let's say 10 of those are attorneys. I mean, it won't be enough to break even, but let's say I can do it. Those 10 attorneys, the caseload they would have carried is now going to be carried by all the other attorneys. So now attorneys who have time to do really good work and avoid wrongful convictions because they have time to pour over the open file discovery that we get in Brooklyn and read every line now they won't have time to do that all the time on every single case, and they may miss the one clue that's buried in the paperwork that might have exonerated their client. They will no longer have the energy to fight, you know, unjust policies and, and you know, things that are, let's say, applied differently for different clients. What happens is you now have a staff that is exhausted, and they, they, the quality of the work can very quickly change. And I, I just want to say that I think it's really important that we address this problem now. We have done all that we can do over the years of flat funding to save as much money as we can, to keep our staff motivated, to keep our highly dedicated and very talented staff that we are able to get from around the country to come work here, you know, in one of the best, you know, really in the best public defender system in the country. We are at the point now that it's all going to fall apart. So it's really important that the city council take this moment and treat it very seriously. We have never come to you to say, 
solve this problem with MOCJ. We have always found a way to solve it ourselves, but this is the year that we're saying we need intervention. I just wanted to add one more thing, which is um, you did ask me about raise the age. We're having some concerns about raise the age. Um, I'm happy to talk about it if you would like. You can ask well, that, That's going to be one of my questions, so yeah. let's, let's okay. leave it to that. Um, so I think with that in mind, pass to Justine. Great. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Justine Olderman. I'm the executive director at the Bronx Defenders. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'd like to pick up on something that Lisa talked about um, and that I think will ultimately end up helping to transition to uh, the next group of providers that are going to testify, um, which is to highlight um, not only the model at the Bronx Defenders and the model um, that has been reflected by the other panelists, but also the experience of our clients. So I'm going to give you an example. We don't have clients here testifying, but I do want to bring them into this room. We had a client, I'll just call her D. She came to America with her two young sons in 2016, fleeing sexual and physical gang violence in her home country of Honduras. Upon her arrival, she and her children sought placement at a family shelter. They went through the long and arduous process of applying for placement, and they were repeatedly denied. By the sixth time they went to apply for the shelter, Dee was exhausted. She was struggling with her physical health. She struggled from lupus, but she didn't have insurance and had no way to pay for her medication. And while online, her young sons began to fight. And the stress got to her, and she did something she had never, ever done before, which was that she struck her young child. Because she was in the shelter, and within the shelter there was police officers there, she was immediately placed under arrest. After her arrest, her boys were removed from their mother's custody and placed in stranger foster care. And within weeks, both were psychiatrically hospitalized due to the trauma of the separation. At the Bronx Defenders, we represented Dee in her criminal, family, housing, and immigration case. Through our team of advocates working collaboratively with each other in constant communication about the complicated interplay between the different justice systems, we ultimately were able to use that information to advocate. And today, she resolved, we were able to resolve her criminal case with a non-criminal disposition that was uh, immigration safe and did not impact her asylum application. Her boys were returned to her through our family defense advocacy. And she was finally accepted through the help of our housing advocacy into a shelter, a family shelter in the Bronx. Her asylum case is, case is currently scheduled to be heard in August 2018. We do not expect, I'm sorry, August 2019. We do not expect a decision, however, for years. And in the meantime, she's been granted temporary status and can live and work without fear of deportation. Without question, if we asked the members of this council, if we asked MOCJ, if we asked OCJ, is this what you want to provide to New Yorkers who are forced to go through the justice system, they would all say yes. But that ability to serve our clients in that way is under threat for all the reasons that you have heard. I won't repeat the ones about funding, um, but I do think that what's helpful to note is that because we represent, we, we at the Bronx Defenders, our interdisciplinary model allows us to see not just what is happening in the criminal context, but to see the connections across all of the different practice areas and all of our different funding sources. And as Lisa highlighted, we are seeing the exact same issues across the board. We are seeing underfunding, honestly, with the exception of the money that the city council has designated to the NIFA program. But we are seeing in every other area underfunding that threatens our ability to serve the clients in the way that this city wants us to be able to do. Not only that, what we are seeing is that there are um, contracting and budgeting problems that plague every single one of our contracts that exacerbates the funding deficiencies that have already been testified to today. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about not just the delays with the RFP, but delays in contract amendments, delays in getting our contracts registered. I'm talking about delays in getting overages money when we exceed our targets and the city is now 
required to reimburse us for the costs that we laid out in doing more than what they anticipated that we would do. We are talking about delays in getting invoices paid. All of that exacerbates the uh, funding crisis that you have heard about throughout this afternoon. But there is one other thing that I want to bring to this council's attention which is that we are also seeing, it was alluded to uh, just a few minutes ago, at the same time that we are seeing some, some changes in the way that the city is thinking about funding services for justice-involved people in ways that are, are heartening and are exciting for us to be thinking about, we are also seeing restrictions in unprecedented ways. What do I mean by that? Currently, under our model, our, under our contract with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, we are allowed to use our funding to represent people in uh, immigration proceedings and also in civil proceedings. And there is no limit except for our own allocation of resources to the types of representation that we can do. It allows us to go where the client goes. It allows us to bring that level of expertise that we have. Under the new RFP, while they are separately funding immigration and while they are separately funding uh, civil lawyers in ways that we're heartened by, they are restricting what we can do with that money and limiting it to advice and counsel only. Now, they will come back to you and say, and you can question them about this on the 20th, Office of Criminal of Civil Justice will say, and Mock J will say, well, that's because now we have access to justice. OCJ is now paying for that. But OCJ is limiting how we are able to intake our clients. And we are only able to intake our clients if we are willing to engage in an arraignment-like intake process through housing court which means we are intaking clients that are not necessarily the clients like D who are going through the criminal justice system or going through the family court system. Limitations there. And then we see the limitations on the IOI funding and the knife foot funding that have already been talked about today. Wait, so I, just, I just want to understand. Maybe I didn't ask the question properly to Mr. Dressler, but I, I thought that I asked, are you referring to the, the 170 crimes and limitations on, on, on representation and yes so, so those restrictions apply to the IOI funding and it also applies to the knife up funding what I think you were getting at was a question about whether it was now going to apply to the housing uh, contracts our understanding is that it is not but it does apply to IOI funding and does apply to the 170 in ways we haven't no, I, seen I, I before. thought that I, I thought that my up. question was was directly limited to knife up I said is I don't maybe I'm remembering a much smarter question than I actually asked. But I, I, if I had asked him, is the 170 limitation limited, exclusion limited to NIFUP, and he had said yes, would, would is that what I asked? Is, is I think you asked whether the 170 carve out applies to any other contracts. And the answer to that was no, because there had been a question about, uh, when I say a question, I mean among providers, civil providers, and the council, I think, whether they were applying that to, let's say, their housing contracts with the providers. They are not doing that. But the 170 applies to the IOI contracts, and it does also apply to the knife up contract. When it comes to the housing contracts, now it's wonderful that they are rolling out this expanded um, access to justice, access to representation for tenants, but they are limiting the ways in which we can represent those people. In other words, they're limiting the intake, the ways we can intake those clients. So a client like D, for example, would not, we would not be able to represent her in her application for shelter placement. That would have to ultimately end up coming through a different funding stream possibly by a different contract provider. Whereas before, under our criminal contract, and, and as is the case right now, we were able to represent her throughout. So I just raise that so that uh, as this council is looking at contracting issues and budgeting issues, you are also aware of that at the same time that the city seems to be expanding and very much is trying to expand access to representation in all sorts of different ways and really looking at the model and trying to ensure that they are recognizing th the need for us to address causes and consequences of various justice involvement and that just Justice involvement tends to beget more justice involvement and that there's this intersectionality. They are also creating limits in ways that make it difficult for us to meet our clients' needs. Great. Um, okay, so you finished. Can I ask some questions? Yeah. So can anyone tell us why either 
what they've been told from Mock J or what you might be able to surmise that Mock J put out this RFP without um, and 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 has has not um, uh, acted on on what what it put out right. I, I've been to I've been you know chairing this committee I guess for four years now. Well, yeah, I guess this is my fourth budget uh, hearing. Uh, the issue of wraparound services and and um, uh, interdisciplinary representation and all of that is something that that we've been talking about has been very important to the council and to a degree it's what what mock j tried to 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 embrace i'm going to ask them on the 20th but what have you been told us as, as to as to why so and every time we have raised this with the high level staff of mock j or uh, elizabeth glazer what we hear is that they do understand. And in fact, I actually think that they were well-intentioned and meant everything they said in the concept paper. Um, and in fact, when we raised uh, an issue about our structure, the contract structure, right now we are, and since 2011, paid on a cost per case. Bef way before the concept paper came out, we all met with uh, the Mock J team and said, the cost per case model that's been used by, and it was in place under the old administration, is fundamentally unfair. Because it, what it does is it actually um, required uh, the arrest and prosecution of a lot of low-level offenses to help us then pay for the other group of people who were charged with more serious crimes. And so it created this feeling like uh, the system was being funded on the backs of poor black and brown people swept up on broken windows policing. We raised that with Liz and her team, and in fact she agreed, and continues to agree. We're being told that it is OMB, and that the city right now is in um, dire straits and concern because of the potential cuts coming from the city and state. Uh, we recognize that that is perhaps a fear. But again, you have to figure out how to fund the criminal justice system. You can't leave it out of the equation. You can't restrict contracts or exclude people or simply not fund us and keep us flat because the Trump administration is in play. In fact, now's the time to actually fully fund us so that we could actually do what we do best, which is press against oppressive government, including the federal government. So um, that's what we're being told. I'm looking forward, I think we all are, to the official answer on the 20th, um, but and, you know, we, have ha we have now have to draw a line and make this as public as we can. Um, you know, I, I, you know, we are all, we, we heard the parity uh, push from the DAs, um, and I have to say this, and, and often lately I find myself agreeing with many of the points they're making. They are right. Their staff needs parity with Corp Council, but so do ours. Their attrition is high. I have 56 open positions, many of them very uh, attorneys who wanted to come here, came during our diversity efforts to increase diversity of public <coughs> defenders are leaving to either go to better city positions, uh, state OCA positions, same as the DAs, or out of the jurisdiction because New York City is simply too expensive to live, pay your student loans, and start a family. I just wanted to add one thing. When they are here on the 20th, I think it would be helpful to ask about the interplay of the different contracts. Because as I am in conversations with the same people at Mock J about different contracts, I am hearing that there is an interplay. So it's almost as if there is a fixed amount of money that is allocated to MOCJ. And what is happening with the family court filings, um, the messaging that we have been getting is that in some ways it is eating up available funding for other things. Um, and even when it comes to the family defense funding, 
um, we had a contract uh, that increased our targets and therefore to keep up with the pace and therefore had to increase our monthly invoice. And they were asking us to bill them at the 2017 invoice because they actually could not afford to pay us at the higher rate. So there's something about sort of the, the, the pot of money that they have that has not actually expanded to meet the growing need, not only in the family uh, defense world, but also in the criminal defense world. And that there, there seems to be a little bit of, a, of an interplay there. So could you tell us how uh, this has impacted your, 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 your practices in terms of, I don't know, case loads per, per, uh, per attorney. Um, and also, I think I understand that some of you, or perhaps all of you, have invested or had invested in personnel and who knows what else in order to meet the, the requirements, only to be told that those requirements and, and the money that comes with it aren't gonna, gonna come into effect. So, so how, how, what's the, some kind of measurement of the hardship? Right. So. Lisa already alluded to this, but if I have seven attorneys that have retired and or are leaving, and they each have a caseload of 65 cases, you know, that you know, 420, you know, 440 cases now has to be distributed amongst the remaining attorneys, which now I'm seven less. It also means that those attorneys have to do more arraignment shifts. So instead of them doing three arraignment shifts a month, they're doing four arraignment shifts a month, which means their pending caseload goes up, and then everything Lisa alluded to Right? in terms of getting to a place where they were able to get lower caseloads and then do more referrals and, and take a different approach to what they have traditionally done is in jeopardy. Um, and so if our choice is do we pay the rent, pay health care, and pay our bills, or do we replace the lawyers? We can't replace the lawyers because we have to meet all those operating costs. And so it is going to, I mean, we are at a precipice. Um, we were able to do this for a year. Now they're talking about six months, potentially another year, and I, for one, cannot make it to another fiscal year. And the other thing, you know, I found myself sitting here listening to the DAs being struck by how much I agreed with all the things they were saying, which is, you know, sort of for the first time, perhaps. Um, but listening to them to talk about the cost of attrition, so Stan's talking about rising caseloads and increased uh, obligations to, to staff court parts. What does that lead to? It leads to greater attrition. Right? It leads to burnout at an exponential pace. And then not only do we have the costs that are incurred um, you know, in the ways Stan was just highlighting, but now we have costs incurred with even if we did have the money in all of the excesses of having to uh, recruit, hire, and train people and all of the loss of knowledge and expertise that the DAs were talking about, we see the exact same thing when caseloads rise. my thought. Oh, oh, I know. I wanted to say that uh, another thing the DAs talked a lot about was how even though the number of low-level arrests have gone down, the pending load of felonies has not changed at all in the last few years. I think the arrest rate hasn't changed either on felonies. I mean, it's gone a little bit down, but everything, you saying maybe up? Just to, to so I was at a recent meeting where um, Mock J had data that showed that the violent felony arrests are, are basically pending at the same level, but gun cases have gone up, right. gun prosecution. So we do not see, you know, when we measure our workload of our attorneys by the cases that they have pending at any given time, and that workload has not changed, you know, as a whole for the office. So every person that you remove from that equation, that workload has to get done by somebody else. So if you lose a social worker, there's that many fewer people that you can provide social work services. So you might have somebody that might have had a chance to go to mental health court, but you can't necessarily establish um, their mental illness in a way that gets them into that court. Um, you lose a paralegal, you lose an immigration attorney, and that's that many fewer people that can get really good immigration advice and potentially even a little more. Because in our office, we have a continuum of immigration care. If you come in with a criminal case, and that's, you know, we have people getting arrested by ICE at least twice a week, every week in Brooklyn now. So if you get picked up by ICE in court, 
your attorney that you already had you know, uh, to advise you on your criminal case can then put together what needs to happen so that when you get to your hearing, your knife up attorney is ready to actually make a bond hearing you know, request for you. So there's a lot of this sort of continuum that it's just, it's going to evaporate very quickly. And it took us a very long time to put these things together. And I agree, we need the experts. I mean, to have a group of immigration attorneys that are operating at that level and are able to step in and understand exactly what needs to happen so that we can actually give somebody a really good shake to get out um, when they get to immigration court, I mean, that, you can't just replace that tomorrow with another person. Um, I had asked you to, if you could, give us a preview of what you think the city um, or within the, the five boroughs it needs to be looked at in terms of being ready for raise the age. We are hoping to have a hearing on it um, this spring. But if you could give us a preview of what you're seeing not happening or is happening, just, just the highlights. I mean, it's a broad question. I think they're trying. I mean, I'm going to say that I do believe that there are a lot of meetings. They're being run by a combination of people from OCJ and a consulting organization, as well as the court system through Judge Richardson Mendelson. Um, we've been to, I would say, dozens of meetings. Um, here are some concerns that I have. They have yet to decide how they're going to fund basically the legal services within this. They have yet to determine how they're going to staff the court parts, because there's new different courtrooms. Um, they have yet to really say, okay, this is how we're going to do it. And they have yet to say what's going to happen to the young people who start in adult court, let's say, and then transfer to family court, which is a very large group of people that previously you either kind of went to one court or the other, but now there's this other bucket of cases, so to speak. We did get a call recently from OCA. Now there's, an, there's a, the, the problem is that the city pays for the funding in adult courts, but OCA pays for funding in family courts for juveniles. So there has to be some interrelationship between the funding. OCA has called us and asked us if we're interested, and I don't, they're going to start some kind of process for contracting, I think, pretty soon. But they also are having trouble understanding what Mock J's plan is, which they have to overlay their plan on top of Mock J's plan, as they also do with other monies that they, that they help fund. Um, that's one problem that I think we face that's you know, it's just adding to some of our stress and dilemma. But there are a couple of things that are going on that I think are probably not really the best thing for clients that have come up during these meetings, and I just thought I would just target those issues. The first one is that for, um, for many of these young people, the, the, de the police can release them on what's called an FCAT, meaning so the kid gets arrested, let's say it's a marijuana case, they give them an FCAT and they tell them to come back to court, I don't know, the next day or the next day after that. Um, there are a certain group of, of young people that are not given an FCAT that the police feel they need to detain basically for arraignment, which is called different thing in family court. Those young people um, are scheduled to go into the new adolescent offender parts for their arraignment, but those are only open from Monday through Friday. So there was a discussion about what to do on the weekend. Sometimes you have a young person and they're avail you know, they need to be arraigned on the weekend. In fact, a lot of our clients get arrested on Saturday nights, as you can imagine. So currently, they have a small time during the, in Manhattan. They bring JOs from around the city, and that means 15 and under, who are in that same circumstance, and they bring them to Manhattan, and they arraign them there um, from around the city. So there's going to be more. There's going to be a lot more. And we ask them to have one in every borough. I mean, for somebody to get from, you know, Coney Island in Brooklyn to Manhattan or from, you know, the northern part of the Bronx into Manhattan, it's, it's really burdensome. And that's what parents have to do. And if parents aren't there, it's very likely that the kid will be held another period of time. So we have been told that that's not going to happen, that they're maintaining this practice of, of doing these cases on the weekends only in Manhattan. Now, another option would be to open family court and do the cases in family court. <laughs> Um, and I'm thinking that might be for a certain different, I, it's hard to keep track of which group of young people would be in, but the, one of the reasons they don't want to open a family court on the weekends, I mean, it's budgetary, but it's also because there are other areas of family law where if there is a part open on the weekends that they would have to give people certain rights. So for example, if I have a client whose child is removed, 
let's say. They have a right to a hearing in three days. But if there's a court open on the weekend, that might count towards the three days. So they're actually trying to interfere in some ways, or they don't want to provide that. So that is concerning because it's, very, it's a big disadvantage for our parents to be able to get into Manhattan. Another issue, which I also think isn't right, is isn't right and it's not consistent with Raise the Age, is that um, right now in family court, you can only initiate a prosecution for a misdemeanor. And if you want to maintain a felony charge for a 16 or 17 year old in family court, it has to start in adult court and then be moved to family court. So initially, and the, we're talking about low-level felonies, so let's say maybe it's a shoplifting over, let's say, the legal amount, and it makes it a felony, so you're talking about an e-felony. Traditionally, our DAs all have reduced those cases to misdemeanor, especially for young people. But if they decline to take the case because it's a misdemeanor, then it goes to family court only as a misdemeanor. So originally, the DAs all agreed that that was a good plan, and the reason for that was it gets the kids out of the precinct faster. The DA says, no, I'm not gonna take the case. Off they go with their FCAT to go to family court. But court counsel did not want that methodology. They wanted the case to stay a felony. So now the kids are gonna have to go to court for their arraignment in adult court, and then they will get a lawyer, one of us, and then that case will then be transferred to family court. So a couple of things are happening in there that are really against the model that Raise the Age was designed to create. So those are some examples. Okay, good. Anyone else? So lastly, um, I had asked the, the DAs, I'll ask your offices as well, do you maintain uh, demographic data on your attorneys um, and would you be able to share that with us? Obviously, we're not interested in people's individual names, but um, <clears throat> what your offices look like and, and where those, those attorneys are assigned, which courts, and, and uh, what their, I guess maybe their titles are so we know who are supervisors and who are line attorneys. We, we do track that data, um, and I could provide that to you broken down by our different contracts. Terrific. Let's go down the line. Yeah, we, we do track it. Uh, for those of us who are in the first department, the IDOC Oversight Committee actually asked very pointed questions about that. Uh, we are, in terms of our attorneys, uh, about one-third of our attorneys are people of color. If you look at our total staff, it's about 40 percent, and we've been pretty consistent with those numbers. We also keep track of it. Some of our funders require us to provide that data. So we ask people when they get hired, you know, they self-report. Um, some of it's in our testimony, but we can provide more detail. Yeah. We do. Um, a number of years ago, uh, we have, uh, we're unionized, obviously. We have three caucuses that represent uh, black attorneys of legal aid, attorney of color, le uh, attorneys of color at legal aid, and our LGBT caucus, and our 1199. Uh, unions uh, created a joint management committee to look at diversity and inclusion, and we began to ask staff to self-identify. Um, obviously, people could opt out in a whole host of identities that we believe are in, important for us to um, make sure our recruitment and our professional development and our workplaces um, have the most diverse and most affirming place for our staff to work. So we have the data, but we also have training and inclusion programs. We have an LGBT law and policy unit that does uh, competency training and litigation, and we are launching our racial justice unit, and we've just posted for the supervisor of that unit. So we go beyond data to really look at real in intrinsic inclusion and affirmation in our workplace. Um, I had just pulled the basic data on our attorney staffing. So um, of our attorney staffing, this is across all practice areas, 38% report being people of color. Um, but in terms of the breakdown that you just specified, I can get that for you and, and provide that. Great. <clears throat> okay, and we'll follow up on that with a letter. Thank you all very much. Um, appreciate your testimony. Thank, Thank you. you. Next will be our civil legal services providers. How about, what's that? Several of them, yes. Um, our friends from the Legal Aid Society, the New York Legal Assistance Group, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, Legal Services NYC, and Legal Services Staff Association. Come on down.
want to sit next to Adrian. Is is um, the Center for Court, Court Innovation? Are they still around? CCI. Why, why don't you join this um, this this uh, distinguished group of legal services providers and others? All right, folks, raise your right hand, please. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, it's been a long day. Let's try to keep it to five minutes. And um, if you want to start, uh, just go from left to right. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lansman and members of the Justice and Public Safety Committees. Um, I appreciate your time, especially at this late hour. I'll try to make it brief. Um, my name is Amanda Berman. I am the project director of the Red Hook Community Justice Center, which is a project of the Center for Court Innovation. And I'm here to urge the council to support the Center for Court Innovation as it seeks to strengthen and expand public safety, alternative to incarceration, youth diversion and access to justice programs through $1 million in support from the City Council in fiscal year 2019. This would include a $500,000 continuation of funding for ongoing operations and an additional $500,000 enhancement, which would help us to advance the City Council's goals of improving fairness and working toward the closure of Rikers Island. Support from the Council is crucial to the continuation of our public safety and alternative to incarceration programs throughout the five boroughs. Our programs, which include the Red Hook Community Justice Center, the Crown Heights Community Mediation Center, SOS South Bronx, the Midtown Community Court, Bronx Community Solutions, Queens Youth Justice Center, Staten Island Youth Justice Center, uh, Staten Island Justice Center, amongst others, have been documented by independent evaluators to improve safety, reduce incarceration, and enhance public trust in government. We work with tens of thousands of New Yorkers each year at these project sites, and the vast majority of the people that we serve are youth, LGBTQ, immigrants, low income, or people of color. Through our ongoing partnership with the City Council, we've worked to reduce incarceration and we've made New York City safer for all. So with expanded support from the Council, the Center's youth diversion programs would be a vehicle to the successful implementation of Raise the Age reforms beginning in October of this year. The center's diversion programs in each of our boroughs currently serve thousands of young people each year through programs such as counseling, academic support, and workforce development. Support from the council will enable the center programs to serve an estimated 30% more vulnerable at-risk youth who will soon be charged with delinquency in family court by providing meaningful off-ramps to detention whenever possible. The Center for Court Innovation is also making a deep investment in improving access to civil justice. Our work in this area includes linking tenants and housing disputes to benefits and social services assistance. Our programs also aim to arm New York City residents facing housing, immigration, and employment issues with legal information. Council support will allow us to expand our just access to justice work and to serve hundreds of additional low-income New Yorkers. The City Council's support has been invaluable to the success of the Center for Court Innovation. We look forward to continuing to work with the Council to reduce incarceration and to enhance youth justice and access to justice. We respectfully urge you to continue to support our work, and I thank you again for the opportunity to speak. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> You. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I am Jay Ackley. I'm the um, treasurer and an executive committee member of the Legal Services Staff Association. Um, and I'm a senior grants and contracts management specialist at Legal Services NYC. Um, thank you, Council Member Lansman and the members of the Committee on the Justice System for allowing LSSA to testify about our work with the City Council on behalf of low-income New Yorkers. 
Um, we at LSSA are the staff employees of Legal Services NYC and Mobilization for Justice. We are uh, part of the National Organization of Legal Services Workers and the UAW. We represent all non-management staff employees at LSNYC and MFJ, including paralegals, secretaries, attorneys, social workers, process servers, and maintenance workers. Uh, the City Council has been tremendously supportive of the work that we do and has asked LSNYC to be one of the major providers of New York City's expanded efforts to fight displacement and gentrification, first through the Tenants' Rights Campaign and now with Right to Council. We appreciate the faith and responsibility you've placed in our staff and our union members to serve the low-income tenants of New York City. This is a tremendously important step forward for tenants. We hope that as this program continues to expand, that the City Council continues to look for ways to fully fund these services. You know the right to counsel, though it provides an unprecedented amount of funding, still does not fully fund the work that is being asked of providers. This forces providers to cut corners, making tough decisions to not hire a social worker who could connect clients to needed services or talk to a tenant in a mental health crisis. Hiring fewer process servers and secretaries and paralegals that we really need. This results in support staff being overloaded and attorneys having to take on overwhelming amounts of peripheral administrative work leading to widespread frustration and inefficient delivery of services. Underfunding of the actual cost of the work also forces us to cut corners by spending less time on each ca case than our clients deserve. We do not want to become factories churning out pro forma stipulations of settlement. Our clients deserve more than that. Please help us by fully funding what it actually takes to provide quality representation. The rapid pace of expansion has also placed tremendous strain on the court's physical locations. Our advocates are being forced to meet with new clients in the hallways and stairwells of courthouses. Not only does this compromise their confidentiality to share their stories within earshot of strangers and landlords' attorneys, it is tremendously undignified and insulting to force tenants to do this. It also puts them at risk, at risk of identity theft as they must share sensitive identity information in a public setting, and for many tenants, at risk of detention by ICE as ICE agents are targeting courthouses looking for immigrants. The other challenge I'd like to raise is the administrative burden and delay posed by the city's cost reimbursement system. This time required to voucher for the work creates a significant administrative burden that cuts into the time available to provide the actual client services. This vouchering process can be an impediment to the work, particularly when receivables can remain outstanding for extended periods of time. Our staff and organizations want to do the best work we can for tenants. Please help us by continuing to identify additional sources of funding for this work, finding confidential space within the courthouses to meet with tenants, and by finding ways to streamline and reduce the administrative burden on programs. Turning toward a new program on the horizon, we want to express our strong support for the proposed funding for legal services for low-wage workers. The rights of immigrant workers, workers of color, and low-wage workers are all under attack. Our members at LSNYC and MFJ work with low-wage workers whose employers steal their wages, discriminate against them based on past criminal histories, and more. The need is urgent. We can and must do more to support these workers. Nonprofit legal services providers and worker centers have the will and ability to keep these workers, to help these workers in a way that private attorneys cannot and do not. Your direct funding of legal services providers and worker centers will help us expand our support to individual workers as well as workers organizations who organize groups of workers to achieve justice and obtain wages that have been stolen from them. Thank you. Thank you. Ron. Uh, I'm, I'm Ron Rasmussen. I'm the Executive Director of, of Legal Services NYC. And with my colleague uh, Jay Ackley from the Legal Services Staff Association, we thank you, Council Member Lansman, and all the members of the committee for your support um, for civil legal services and justice in New York City. I want to make three short points. The first is that even with significant funding from the city and the state, there are millions of New Yorkers, low-income New Yorkers, who are not getting access to the services, to the legal services that they need. The report of the, the November 17, 2017 report of the New York State Commission, Permanent Commission on Access to Justice, showed that we're serving at best a third of the people who need our services. Uh, tw and there are, in New York City alone, there are 1.7 million low-income New Yorkers with incomes under the federal poverty level, which is only $25,000 for a family of four. It's impossible to imagine living on that amount and impossible for those people to get the services that they need to survive. And the situation, as you know and we all know, may get worse with what is going on in Washington, including the elimination, the p potential elimination that has been proposed by the President for the past two years of the Legal Services Corporation. 
the loss of that funding would be $385 million for the nation, $21 million in New York State, and $11.7 million here in New York City that would be taken away from services for low-income New Yorkers. The second point I want to make is to first, of course, thank you for your leadership in creating and helping to implement the universal access to counsel. But we have a concern. In addition to the, to the, um, the issues that uh, Jay raised just a minute ago, we have been told that over time, the funding for the universal access to counsel will become the only funding that's available for housing work. And that will mean that our services will be focused exclusively on eviction defense work and not, include, and not be able to include the important affirmative work that's necessary to make sure that we don't continue, continue to hemorrhage rent-regulated apartments because we can't sue landlords affirmatively to prevent them from, en masse, as is going on throughout the city, illegally registering rents, illegally increasing rents, illegally deregulating rents. There are laws that this council has passed um, to prevent the discrimination of source of income to allow tenants to sue for harassment that will not be able to be implemented or enforced unless there are legal services that can do that work and unless there's funding that can do that work. So this is not an immediate problem, but we want it to continue to be part of the conversation that if the funding is solely focused, as we've been told it will be over time, on eviction defense work, that's not enough, and so, that's not, that's so not going to be good enough. When would, you, when would you see that actually happening if it happens? Like um, well, fortunately, right now, there is funding for the, um, the TRC, Tenant Rights Campaign work, which is part of the, what was rolled out last year and the year before in areas that are subject to rezoning. That, some of that funding is projected to, in, to continue uh, in East Harlem. But in the Bronx, for example, where there's a massive rezoning plan, there's no guarantee of continued funding there to do the kind of affirmative work that I'm talking about. And it's unclear, there's not, a, there's not a longer term commitment from the city to fund that kind of work. So it's something that we're talking with the city about. They're very aware of our concerns about this, um, but we wanna make sure that you are too, and that this conversation continues to be part of what is discussed and considered with respect to, to funding. Got it. So the last point that I want to make um, is that as Harvard University professor Matt Desmond has said in his book, Evicted, without housing, everything else falls apart. But for our clients, even with housing, everything else is falling apart. And that's because that's what poverty does. Without funding for services for special education, for safety from domestic violence, for people who are disabled who need to increase their incomes by applying for federal disability assistance, for low-wage workers who need help getting unemployment insurance. Without funding for those services, our clients will continue to be hurt. And so we're, we're very grateful for the funding that the council has provided through legal services for low-income New Yorkers, and we, in in a partnership with the Legal Aid Society and the New York Legal Assistance Group are asking for an increase in that funding for the coming year. So thank you very much for your support. Got it. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to, I think it is on. Yeah, you can hear me right? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I check. Um, good afternoon. Um, th I really do appreciate at this late hour that you all are still here. Um, it's been a very long but very informative day. Um, if I can just continue on what uh, um, Ron Rasmussen has said, uh, one of our major partners here as, as well as the other providers here, using Matthew Desmond, um, his book Evicted has turned into our Bible, but he says quite eloquently, as mass incarceration is for black men, um, eviction um, basically has become a real problem um, for black women and their families. And what we're seeing more and more as um, the, our practice has expanded in housing is that there still are these other issues. There always have been these other civil legal services issues that have come out of the cases. But as we've expanded our housing practice significantly and as we've expanded our immigration practice, during the pendency of those cases, there are still a whole host of other civil legal services 
issues that fall out of those cases, as well as issues that arise throughout the community and issues that arise outside of targeted zip codes or rezoned areas. And so that is why, um, together, as a community, we're asking for some enhanced uh, resources um, with the low, um, um, uh, low uh, legal services for low-income New Yorkers funding, and we would like to see that funding increase so that we can continue to provide those wraparound services that come in as well as augment all the civil legal services, uh, services that we still are lacking the capacity to be able to provide. I'd like to call your attention, and it just can't be stated enough, that we are concerned about the shortfalls um, in funding that we're going to be experiencing as we continue to roll out universal access. We are very grateful for that legislation that came about in August, but we still remain very concerned with there not being a clear understanding as where we will land with the full funding. Not only that it be a robust and comprehensive housing practice where we can actually talk about staving gentrification and displacement of our communities with affirmative cases, as Ron has stated, um, whether it's bringing affirmative cases, working with tenant associations and buildings, but it's also the idea that um, the additional space that is required for us us, our employees, as well as what the courts are going to have to do to try to accommodate the joining of counsel. The ideas that uh, the, the staffing that's required and even the administrative um, requirements of this funding is something that there is a shortfall. And so we're concerned about how we're supposed to pay for this expansion. Very needed and very grateful to have the opportunity, but want to make sure that it's done in a way that's responsible, in a way that we can actually sustain the program. I appreciate so much this council's support, very, very obvious support of immigrants and immigrant rights. And even this past summer, um, the real issue um, that we encountered, not only with all of the immigration expansion, but particularly with the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project. I am so glad that you all remain diligent in trying to make sure that we preserve that program. And I'm so grateful to the city council that they continue to fund that program. Um, we ask that we be able to continue with that funding and that there con continue to be consideration by the council on how complex and difficult those cases are, not only in the legal issues that they present, but also in the fact that the, the program is one that's quite involved because so many of our staff have to travel to New Jersey or upstate to visit the clients. There is not readily available technology that allows them to deal with some issues with the clients remotely, that a lot of the clients continue to have issues with the conditions of the jails where, they're, where they stay, and that there are continue to be medical issues. But we thank you. And lastly, if I can quickly, we are very excited about the prospect of being able to have um, legal services for low-wage workers. Again, it's a big issue that we continue to see for many years. It is a shame that so many folks in our community continue to qualify for civil legal services, yet have one, two, and sometimes three jobs and are oftentimes exploited. We look forward to being able to participate in a robust representation of low-wage workers, whether it's through discrimination, labor trafficking, dealing with UI issues, dealing with criminal record discrimination. Um, we are and we stand ready to do this work, but also to see an expansion to be able to safeguard their rights. Thank you. Uh, Chair Lansman, thank you. Thank you to members of the committee um, uh, for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Beth Goldman, and I am the president and attorney in charge at the New York Legal Assistance Group. Um, when we were all here a year ago, I think we all were here with a lot of trepidation about what was coming. Um, we had reason to be fearful, um, and I think uh, we have found that many of the concerns we had at the time uh, were in fact uh, valid. Um, and so today I think I want to emphasize two things, some of which I think really have been ably said by my colleagues here, but I want to echo some of the, the things that they have raised. I think the first thing I want to do is, of course, emphasize how extraordinary it is that the city has done what it has done. And I think it's, uh, while I share the concerns that my colleagues have about um, universal access and how it's going to play out in terms of the funding, I do think it's too soon for us to be, uh, um, to, to not be uh, impressed and proud of, of where we are and what we're doing. And, um, 
and we've, we are already seeing the results. We're already seeing the impact that we're having um, and just the, both in the volume of cases and in the, the impact generally. I think we also find, uh, given our model, which is a, a community-based model where we're out there in the community, that our sense is that when this is fully implemented, our ability to get cases from all over and actually help people from all over the city where we find them will be quite extraordinary and to keep them in their homes. Um, on the immigration front, again, the city council and the administration's commitment has been extraordinary. Uh, we are all seeing things on the ground that are just hair raising um, in terms of how um, uh, the federal government is dealing with immigrants. I will share one strange thing. I mean, we are doing, we are seeing things even in something as straightforward as naturalizations, where somebody has every qualification. We have looked at every box. They seem to be eligible and they walk in for their uh, naturalization um, interview and they are served with a notice to appear and place in removal because under this intense scrutiny that's now going on, somebody found something in an affidavit written by a sponsor that turned out not to be accurate and fraud is being attributed to uh, this immigrant. So these are the kinds of things we're all seeing and so um, the value of uh, the commitment of the city to providing services, uh, particularly to deal with removal uh, cases, is exceptionally important and continues to be uh, something that kind of blows your mind when you see what's going on on the street. So the other point I wanted to make, again, similar to what you heard before, is notwithstanding all this commitment, the needs are just tremendous, um, and there are a few places that we want to focus on, but uh, if we're really going to close the justice gap and if we're going to alleviate persistent poverty, we, we have to look at other things. Now, um, again, we've already talked about low-wage workers. Uh, it's an area where um, there's great need and there really are not private attorneys who will take those cases. There's simply not enough in fees uh, for them to help them. Um, we have a very small unit that does this kind of work and we focus on discrimination in particular. Um, there's no doubt that the, the people serving in low-wage jobs are by far the most vulnerable uh, and do not have the remedies and the employers know that. So we are really eager to pursue that. Uh, the other particular areas I'd want to emphasize are children with special needs uh, and getting them special education. Um, it is very difficult to maneuver through this very complicated uh, system that we have in New York City and without attorneys to help through the process, uh, somebody with low income will uh, most likely not be able to get what they need for their child. And if you talk about something that will uh, help poverty persist, the absence of education is certainly one of those things. I also wanted to mention seniors and students with consumer debt. Um, consumer issues, we are seeing an increase in the, the kinds of issues that, are face, that seniors are facing from aggressive debt collectors um, and um, without help to help them vacate judgments um, and get them a favorable out outcome, uh, they really they face many other problems. I wanted to mention one not very popular issue, but actually came up in something that uh, Justine said earlier, which is shelter advocacy. Um, we are seeing people, as we want to get people out of shelters, but sometimes we really need to get people into shelters, and we are seeing people who are being sent out into the street uh, rather than being uh, accepted into shelters, and it's an area uh, at the moment that we really think funding should be considered, and I will not continue with the other items to spare you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Ben McGregor Smythe. I'm the executive director of New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Uh, thank you, Chair Lansman, and the rest of the committee for uh, inviting all of our testimony today. Uh, I wanted to focus in my short time on, a, uh, on the particular legal needs at the intersection of health and, and immigration. Uh, for the past four years, we've been honored to be a part of 
the City Council's Immigrant Health Initiative, uh, along with our community partners, uh, the Academy of uh, Public uh, <coughs> Medical and Public Health Services, Bronx Health Reach, Grameen Virasana, and Plaza del Sol. Uh, and together, the partners have received a half a million dollars in funding uh, in this year from, from the Council to do um, you know, really important work around uh, creative um, legal and medical advocacy um, uh, to really win life-changing and life-sustaining uh, medical care for uh, immigrant clients who didn't otherwise have, have access. Uh, we have two, two main areas of, of services. One is connecting seriously ill, uh, unauthorized immigrants to um, full Medicaid and, uh, and life-changing care. Uh, and the second piece is improving health care in immigration detention, where uh, many thousands of New York City residents are held and are facing just a human rights crisis in, in the healthcare there, um, and you know, of course, the framework for this is the is the exploding and, and unpredictable immigration enforcement that we're seeing uh, across the city and across the country. Um, I just wanted to um, give you two examples of uh, services that our, our, our clients have, have received, um, and then uh, we'll end there. Uh, one is Ms. O, who is a Bronx resident with end-stage renal disease, um, who uh, is from Ghana and had received treatment for many years from uh, Broadway Dialysis in Elmhurst. Um, her, her own doctors actually referred her to NILPI um, for uh, at a comprehensive immigration screening uh, um, to, to uh, see if there was any way of connecting her to more care. She had no hope without uh, a change in her status. Uh, after an immigration application, we were able to um, connect her with full Medicaid. Uh, and um, after a lot of follow-up legal advocacy, uh, she was uh, on a, she got on a transplant list and just a few months ago got a life-changing kidney transplant. The, um, the second one that, that I want to talk about is in the immigration detention context, uh, and that's after a year and a half in immigration detention, uh, our client, Mr. S, uh, was racked in pain, covered in sores, and was at risk of acute infection from his time in immigration detention, and his health had deteriorated just drastically uh, in his time there. Uh, he was, um, he had lost over 60 pounds, he was, uh, often couldn't get out of bed or even move his hand and faced the immediate risk of complete joint disintegration. Uh, when his immigration attorneys got in touch with us, they were in a crisis, and our team mobilized and was able to connect him with a, a network of volunteer medical experts that we've put together um, who were able to do an assessment of the health risks that he faced in immigration detention and put together a, a package for humanitarian relief to the Department of Justice. Uh, and four days after we met him, he was released uh, into his uh, community and is now at home in Washington Heights getting the care that he uh, he so desperately needed. Uh, and so what we're asking for the, for the council is that uh, it renew its tremendous support for the Immigrant Health Initiative and all of our partners uh, and include an enhancement of $100,000 to deal with the extreme risk that our client communities now face. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, please don't be insulted if I don't ask you any questions. We know each other well. And we know what we have to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's see whoever else is left. Whoever's left standing. Not you. You get your own panel. Brief as it will be. Come on down. Okay, um, they're closing the room in 20 minutes at 6.50. So I don't want you to feel rushed. I just want you to get to the point. Would you please raise your right hand so you can be sworn in? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Would you like to start, ma'am? Thank you. Yeah, the little button. Oh, there we go. Apologies. 
Good afternoon, my name is Jane Lee. I'm a staff attorney at the Community Development Project of the Urban Justice Center, uh, which is a member of the Legal Services for the Working Poor Coalition. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The Legal Services for the Working Poor Coalition is made up of five le civil legal services providers, Canva Legal Services, Housing Conservation Coordinators, MFJ Legal Services, Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation, and the Urban Justice Center. We provide comprehensive civil legal services to working poor New Yorkers who would otherwise not be able to afford an attorney. Together, we have a combined history of serving New Yorkers for more than 125 years and help over 30,000 New Yorkers annually, a majority of them immigrants. Our coalition was created 14 years ago and with the support from the city council, we have addressed the civil legal service needs of thousands of working poor and other low income New Yorkers who are otherwise not eligible for free legal services. In the last few fiscal years, the city council has added not only more funding to this initiative, but has supported this initiative by adding additional organizations so that more low wage and working poor New Yorkers can receive the critical legal services that they need to stabilize their lives. Mm -hmm. The working poor are individuals whose financial situations are only slightly better than our poorest citizens and who cannot afford an attorney when they are faced with legal problems such as foreclosure, unpaid wages, bank account seizure, a denial of government benefits such as unemployment compensation or SNAP food stamps, the need to adjust their immigration status or a non-payment petition from a landlord. Several years ago, Chief Justice Lipman convened a task force which found that even with current legal funding, legal service organizations meet no more than 20% of the need of low and moderate income New Yorkers for civil legal services. This council's funding for, for legal services for the working poor is the only funding that specifically targets the civil legal needs of working people to ensure continued self-sufficiency for working families struggling to survive in New York City. We urge the council to restore and increase funding for civil legal service, service initiatives overall and for the legal services for the working poor allocation in particular. We are asking that the council increase funding for this initiative from approximately 3 million in fiscal year 18 to 3.6 million, which would increase the funding for each of the 11 current providers by $50,000 each, which would allow each organization to more adequately meet the pressing need for these services. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Rachel Bronstein. I'm the managing policy attorney at Her Justice, a nonprofit organization that stands with women living in poverty in New York City with a pro bono first approach by training and mentoring volunteer attorneys to address individual and systemic needs. We recognize the severe shortage of lawyers for low income New Yorkers. Pro bono services are necessary and important complements to legal services in our view, and we work to identify the best places to offer help. I'd like to highlight three elements of our practice briefly. Child support proceedings are of growing concern to us. Over 90% of people who go to court for child support are unrepresented. For many people like our clients, child support is critical, but proving the other parent's income can be complicated. With lawyers in the room, there's someone to ensure that procedure is followed and litigants understand the proceedings. With such a low representation rate, we're concerned about lost income for poor custodial parents. So this year we watched a court watching program that focuses on the clarity of information conveyed to litigants and their opportunity to be heard. This past year has been one of deep turmoil for our clients, particularly for those born outside the United States. By working with us, our clients necessarily have filed for an immigration remedy and therefore should be protected from deportation. Yet the chilling effect of having immigration authorities show up in court causes many of our clients to withdraw from asking for the legal protections they so desperately need. This has caused us to change our client outreach significantly, for example, enhancing our community Know Your Rights clinics. We also continue to participate actively in advocacy around preventing ICE from making arrests in the courts. And finally, a legislative proposal by Governor Cuomo would require judges to order domestic violence offenders to surrender their weapons when they issue an order of protection. Removing guns from domestic violence offenders will keep people safer. 
But while we wait for a divided state legislature to consider the governor's proposal, we can use tools we already have at our disposal. Under existing law and family court, judges have the discretion to ask for guns to be surrendered when issuing orders of protection. If they do, sheriffs can remove guns when they serve the order against the abuser. The problem is, judges almost never ask them to. Domestic violence advocates and attorneys should ask their clients whether their partners have a gun. In court, they should provide specific information about the gun and ask for the gun to be surrendered. The New York City sheriffs who serve orders of protection should be equipped to survey available databases to check whether the person they're serving has a gun involved past. If the sheriffs had specific information and demanded guns to be surrendered, we believe the rates of gun removals would go up, particularly of illegally possessed guns. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair Lansman and committee staff. My name is Andrea Bowen. I'm a consultant working on behalf of the Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Solutions Coalition, which is a coalition of the Anti-Violence Project, Audrey Lord Project, Sylvia Rivera Law Project, GMHC, a bunch of other organizations. Um, uh, these organizations were um, spurred on by the LGBT Caucus of City Council and the previous speaker to sort of learn from the TGNC community across New York uh, what they need in terms of policy solutions and, and budget items um, moving forward. Uh, and one of the items, I've included all six that we've kind of narrowed down. One of the, two of the items that they've brought up uh, were related to um, needs of TGNC immigrants. Um, we have this problem right now where there are Agencies that have plenty of lawyers who can help people with T visas and U visas, and so visas that can help out TGNC immigrants, um, but that don't really know how to work with the TGNC community. And then there are agencies that have the knowledge of the TGNC community and the special types of visas, but they don't have the capacity. So we're asking, um, we, we've asked um, uh, mayoral staff and agencies um, to fund a program um, that would provide lawyers into the system um, at the cost of $715,000. So um, that would be, uh, I think, 10 lawyers to 10 different nonprofits. Um, and so this would add capacity to the system so that you can have lawyers who are at once competent to work with TGNC people, but also know about these specialized visas and be able to do the right work. Um, so uh, we're hoping to get this money from the mayor, um, but in the event that we don't, uh, we would love the support of city council, and I'll end my comments there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good evening, and um, I'm very proud to be the last speaker of, of your very long day. And I'm really here to say a big thank you to the City Council. My name is Kathy Kramer, and I am the new CEO of Legal Information for Families Today, known as LIFT. We're not the car service, but actually we um, are one of the few nonprofits that have a real strong presence in family court. And uh, the Council has been a long supporter of LIFT, and I'm just here to, again, say thank you and hope you will continue the support. We work um, on civil issues in uh, family court having to do with child support, custody, visitation, and orders of protection. We, there are over 250,000 filings in uh, family court, and in most cases, the litigants do not have legal representation. Um, even if they can't afford a lawyer, there are no lawyers available, uh, particularly in child support. 97% of those served by Lyft proceed in court without an attorney, and it's all on issues that really matter to them and their families. Um, for two decades, we've been around providing litigants with the tools they need to su successfully advocate for themselves. We work with parents, grandparents, giving them expert legal advice, legal information, and compassionate guidance. Um, thanks to you all, we've been able to interact with almost 30,000 families over each year. We're, and we're a tiny little organization, but we have a very... Um, we touch tons of people because we do limited representation. We have a helpline that runs from 9 to 5 every day. We receive 14,000 calls every year. We have an attorney in each of the five family courts across the city. 
We have lines outside our office all day long answering questions with and then also scheduling appointments for longer, uh, more intense consultations. We also run programs in communities trying to get to litigants before they have to come to family court. Parenting skills classes for parents who are mandated by ACS and family court. We run legal clinics and know your right workshops in communities. And we have short legal resource guides on 40 different family law topics that are in fifth grade language and they're also uh, fifth grade reading level and they're also translated into eight different languages. They're available online into communities throughout the city. We also work closely with um, sister organizations across the city like Her Justice and make warm referrals whenever um, needed. You, uh, Lyft has a unique relationship with the family court as we partner with them to implement system-wide reforms to increase efficiency and really to improve the family court litigants' experience. We're in a unique position because we're on the ground in the courthouse and so we can help suggest strategic solutions and work with the administrators. We are very thankful for you for your 10 years of support and hope that you will continue to support Lyft in our little but very important niche that we serve. Thank you very much. Yes, when I've been to family court, I've, I've seen you. Great, great. Lift yeah, we're there. right there. Yeah. Yes. So. yes. All Thank right. you so much. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Appreciate your patience. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we do have one more uh, from the public. If you, if you must, because you were here before. I guess you must. Burning desire to testify to us. Okay. Um, so this meeting today is about. Just the, the, slow down. Sorry. All right. Well, you gotta we gotta put you under oath. Raise your right hand. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. You have three minutes, sir. Okay. Um, I was previously here, I testified before you about wage theft that was uh, discussed today. Um, as you uh, know, based on my previous testimony, I have litigation against one of the business partners of HRA. Um, also, there was a public meeting in Brooklyn on December uh, 14th. I recorded Stephen Banks on audio legally about getting legal assistance, and here's exactly what he had to say. So who is this now we're hearing from? The commissioner of HRA. Uh, let me tell you, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't make that up. I cannot make that up. What, what, is, what is the essence of what he said? I'll, I'll summarize it for you. I asked for legal assistance. I've repeatedly asked for legal assistance. HRA has a legal obligation to provide me legal assistance through the Office of Civil Justice, specifically uh, Section 13-B of the New York City Charter. Um, instead, Mr. Banks has been committing fraud all along. Um, I first asked him for legal assistance on March 1st of 2016 at the Yale Club uh, by Grand Central. I gave him about uh, six court transcripts to, to confirm to him that I wasn't wasting his time, that each and every single claim was uh, entirely meritorious. We're now two years after that fact, and I still have not been provided with legal assistance. Um, two of the people that were just in this, at this table were um, Adrian Holder of the Legal Aid Society as well as, as, well as Ron Rasmussen. They were recently part of the Special Commission on the Future of the Housing Courts um, that was established by Chief Judge DeFiore. Um, also, uh, Queens Housing Court Judge Clifton Nemhart, who illegally evicted me from my apartment in 2015. He was actually also a member of that commission. So the question is, if this committee is about justice and this special committee, uh, one of its members is the same person who illegally evicted me from my apartment, what can this com uh, commission that uh, you chair do for people like me such that when the next person ha who has to uh, come before him at the Queens Housing Court, who is 66 year old, years old, used to live in my old apartment building in Regal Park, um, that is being sued by a slumlord that I previously prevailed in uh, without legal counsel, what can you do to, I guess, come to her assistance if it's too late in the game for you guys to come to mine? And the thing is, there's been absolutely no discussion about the fact that Stephen Banks' wife is a super, supervising judge citywide for the housing courts. So the question is, if he's telling me all along, sorry, but I don't know what can be done about past cases, 
if his wife issued a decision, a key decision in 2014, that led a tenant to be restored to possession of her apartment that she was wrong, wrongfully displaced from. And the building where I currently reside, the landlord pulled a bait and switch with me, as well as additional tenants in the building. If there's fraud that's affecting other people, there's no oversight of these apartment buildings, what can you do? All right, thank you, sir. That concludes our hearing. I want to thank uh, the council staff, my staff, our sergeant, uh, sergeants at arms, and um, I don't know what the legal effect of this is, but I'm going to formally adjourn this hearing rather than conclude it so that we may uh, hear testimony on the 20th from Mock J, and we will certainly be inviting uh, Jordan Dressler back. Thank you. Thank you.